You are listening to the In the Mouth of Darkness podcast. Here are Brad, Lisa, Brian, and Dan. Welcome to another edition of the It Modcast podcast. Joining us via Skype is Brian Young, the turtle dork. If you say one more word, I will feed you to my children. I'm kidding, we're vegetarians. <laughs> and also joining us is Lisa Gullickson, wife dork. Guns. So primitive. And Brad Gullickson, mouth dork. You know what? I think I'll just take these, bring them over here, <laughs> and hold on to them for safekeeping. And I'm your host, Darren Smith, the disco dork. I never freeze. And welcome to the It Modcast podcast review cast for Black Panther. Yay! Yes! Yes! It's finally here. Oh my god. <laughs> Howdy dorks. I have literally not stopped thinking about this movie. Not stopped talking about this movie. I'm so excited to yes. talk about this yeah. with my It Mod fam. Uh, thank you for joining us via <laughs> Skype, Brian. Uh, oh yes, I in. definitely did not want to miss this for the world. Although you're in an in extreme amount of pain. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, well, I hope you feel better. In the meantime... We're just uh, going to keep that yes. mysterious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listeners, yeah. you don't need to know. Just know... <laughs> it's medical. ...that Brian <laughs> is in a ton of pain. Uh, yeah. Hemorrhoids. Wait. So. <laughs> It's if, not it, if it was hemorrhoids, that would be okay. We it's don't judge people with hemorrhoids. hemorrhoids that's all. <laughs> all right, so look, it's time to talk about uh, Black Panther. This yes. is a movie that we've been anticipating. Actually, the world has been anticipating for quite some time now. Um, at yeah. as of recording time, it is currently broken. Uh, One hundred and ninety-two million dollars for three days. Of course, that's based on estimates on how it's going to do today, Sunday. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's broken. Yeah. Uh, the Avengers: Age of Ultron. It surpassed that. It's just under uh, the original Avengers as far as superhero Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, it beat out Deadpool's opening yep. for a February film. Yeah, um, I think it's the largest pre-summer opening ever. Uh, it beat the record set by I think it was F. Gary Gray for the, the Fast and the Furious film. Uh, the debut for an, the largest debut for an African American filmmaker. Yep, uh, it beat that. Um, mm, okay, and it's just and this is just what Sunday. So I'm pretty sure that when the dust settles, it would be it will be a, a couple more records broken. Yeah, it's President's Day tomorrow, so they're estimating that over the four days it's going to do 214 million dollars. I think it's going to top that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, to quote Mouth Dork. Uh, after our initial screening, Ooh. when the lights come up, uh, so that's it. We live in a world, you know, with Black Panther now. Yeah. And so you're. I I can always tell, like, when we get to this moment, especially when I'm talking to Brad, because it's like uh, the the your your life was the anticipation. Like all you knew was, I can't wait. I can't wait. I got just got to make it till I get there. You never plan for it's not. I can't wait till I see it, and also let me let me think about what I'm gonna do after I see it. You never say that. You no. always just want to see it, and then once you see it, like okay, now what do I do with my life? Like what, <laughs> is, what is life now? I mean, I really was sort of dreading the release in the sense that I was enjoying the anticipation of the Black Panther movie so much yeah. that I was going to mm-hmm. miss all the Twitter conversation, all the think pieces building up. Uh, to the release of the film, yeah, because it is. I mean, it's a it 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 will be a different world now, like you said, truly. Because it, the just going by the discussion on social media, in light of other discussions that can be found on social media in this particular day and age in our political climate, the the discussion about Black Panther was a positive one, and it was one that was uniting different people from all walks of life, from all places. Over a common thing, which is the the big, the, the greatest thing about our geek culture, anyway, is that it unites different people from different places. And and that conversation about Black Panther was something that, you know, was special. Again, at where we are in our lives now, especially in the U.S. Well, I really want to get Brian's take on it because, you know, we've 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 
discussed this on the podcast before, but if you are joining us specifically to listen to the Black Panther review cast, <laughs> I think it's important for Brian to put out his perspective, especially coming off of that epic Comic Con moment when the entire cast came into Hall H. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to kind of put into words exactly the expectation level um, that you put on a film like this. But uh, going into it and then actually just coming out of the theater and really just seeing and, and my love for Ryan Coogler as a director um, and seeing what he's able to do with this type of material um, just to me was just unprecedented as far as what he was able to do with the characters and the story that he was able to tell. And, and actually, I mean, Seeing it that Thursday night, again, um, as the viewers know, I was kind of in some pain, so I don't think I really got to really absorb the film the way I really wanted to. But going back subsequent times and being able to see it a couple more times, um, and the most recent time today, I've really been able to connect with a lot of what the movie is is trying to say as far as, and even how the movie reflects um, what is actually going on within the conversation uh, uh, that's happening around the movie itself. Uh, one thing that I picked up, and I know we'll probably get to this, this is at towards the end of the movie, but I just want to kind of mention this now, is like one of, one of the most impactful moments for me was the very last scene in that movie when you see the kids on the basketball court and you see uh, T'Challa and, and Shuri you talk about the buildings that we built and you know we're going to start this Wakandan outreach program and it's that idea of outreaching to underprivileged kids or kids who don't have the resources to do a lot of things that they want to do and we saw that um, being reflected in our real world with so many of these people doing um, having these screenings for Black Panther for children that weren't able to do it and the fact that he was able to kind of have that reflection in the film was just so profound to me um, that even within the Marvel film you can have that social consciousness as far as showing people that look we need to extend our hand we need to help the younger generations that can't help themselves and I thought it was just a, 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 a literally a perfect way to end that film but um, I thought it was just fantastic absolutely fantastic all right, uh, Brad. I, I think you know after the obviously we have to have the, that conversation with Brian and get his perspective. But I think um, for me, I'm 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 also interested in your perspective, which is not necessarily maybe the same one as Brian's. But you know yeah. your anticipation, Brad, being a comic book lover and being familiar with this character before it was even thought possible to even assume that there would be, they could be a Black Panther movie. You know, you, like with the rest of the Marvel films, it, you, you bring a lot to the film with anticipation. Okay, I, I know the source material. Is it going to be faithful? Is it going to do it justice? Is the character going to stay, uh, is it is it going to stay representing what he meant to me when I read this as a kid in the books? And, you know, we go into these comic book films and it, it swings one way or the other. You know, either you're, you're satisfied with what they did, they were faithful, or they changed in a little bit or, or enough, or they just totally strayed and got wrong the core of what this character is. What are your thoughts uh, coming into Black Panther and what your hopes and expectations were versus you know what was presented and what were met? Well, you know, we did see T'Challa and the Black Panther in Captain America Civil War, and I absolutely loved you know, Chadwick Boseman's interpretation. And, of course, I love the design of that suit in Civil War. Um, the excitement of this film, of course, is actually entering into Wakanda, uh, this mythical, fictional land, this paradise, this utopia that exists free from the outside world. You know, it's this unconquerable, uncolonized um, dream city uh, that, that that is the excitement about Black Panther, and in a lot of ways, it certainly overshadows the T'Challa character. Mm -hmm. You know, you come away from Black Panther, and you're just so excited about the setting and the supporting cast. Um, I, 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 I absolutely loved it. I, I love this movie. Um, yeah. I think it benefits because of Ryan Coogler making a very personal film within the chain of the MCU. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, he brings the, the, the behind-the-scenes crew with him from Fruitvale Station and Creed. 
Um, you know, you have people like Rachel Morrison, you have people like Hannah Bleacher, Beachler, you have people like Rachel, uh, um, Ruth Carter, Ruth um, Carter, yeah, and um, Gorenson, his composer. Uh, yeah, Ludwig Ludwig Gorenson. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's it feels like this um, extreme artistic endeavor on all fronts, uh, which is a, a, a true thrill. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, I love it. And as far as, like, how does it compare to the comic books? You know, Black Panther is a complicated character from the comic books. He's had uh, so many different interpretations and so many writers uh, and artists tackle him. Uh, it, you know, there aren't a lot of classic runs that people can uh, go to after the movie. There's only really a handful. You know, people talk about the 90s Christopher Priest run. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that's where the Dora Milaje were first introduced. Um, you know, the current writer, ta Coates, Coates, uh, he's really focused on exploring the culture of Wakanda and the language of Wakanda and, and the, the people of Wakanda. And you see, the, um, you know, influence from Brian Stelfreeze's design and the ta Coates Coates run in Black Panther. But this film honestly feels like Guardians of the Galaxy in some ways, in, in the sense yeah. that Guardians of the Galaxy had some decent comic books, but James Gunn went in there and really got to the heart of why he loved these characters and elevated it to something new, and I would say superior to the source material. Mm -hmm. I think Coogler's Black Panther film picks and chooses stuff from you know Jack Kirby, from Christopher Priest, from ta Coates, and create something totally new. The you know sh the Shuri that's in this film is not a Shuri you can find in any comic book. Uh, you know, mm. Okoya, you can't find this Okoya in any comic book. This is a purely cinematic experience. Mm. Mm. Wife Dork, uh, with the MCU, they have a, a you know built-in uh, audience when something like Black Panther comes out because you're a fan of the MCU. Uh, it goes without saying. Um, so outside of just, well, it's the next film in this phase, and I have to see this one before you get to Infinity War. Before, before that, obvious, uh, you know, aside from that, what, what was it about Black Panther that intrigued you the most that you brought into it as far as any excitement or expectations? I just wanted to see the world. I, I wanted to see um, something made from a completely different set of source material that I'm used to. And I'm not just talking about the comics. I myself have not read any Black Panther comics. Mm -hmm. um, he's popped up in various series that I've read, but I've never read like a dedicated Black Panther comic. Mm -hmm. But in terms of um, African culture, Black culture, mm -hmm. um, pulling from a source material that is so underutilized, yeah. getting to see something that's entirely new. The idea of Wakanda being like a place that has literally built itself from the ground up. It's just such a, a, a beautiful idea, you know, uh, bringing in those ideas of the, the lost city of gold and, and, and that kind of lore. And I don't know, I, I, it just m makes you curious. How, how does this work? Yeah. So um, also, m you know, meeting Black Panther in, in Civil War, uh, you know, Marvel, of course, does a great job of getting you excited for yeah. whatever is coming down the pike. Yeah. So, but that is an excellent point, though. The idea of you know the, the costuming being so stunning because we really haven't seen costuming represented from African culture before. So it really does feel like uh, a unique experience. Yeah, yeah. and 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 mm. the score pulling from you know indigenous music, indigenous instruments, and then tying in um, Kendrick Lamar's music. I mean, it's just completely original and and um, mm -hmm. and and new and uh, and like you know we talk about movies you know everything is a remake and everything is uh, a de derived from you know something else you know like well there is a whole world yeah. <laughs> of of shit we can draw from yeah. so. Yeah. So yeah, we're Some, starved for it as an audience. Mm -hmm. Something like Black Panther yeah, exposes it definitely just how we've been deprived of this mm -hmm. entertainment, this culture, mm -hmm. th these people. Yeah, yeah. What were you saying, Brian? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely 
No, I was just saying it's definitely a film that has its own identity. Um, they've, they've definitely been able to carve out uh, its own identity, whether it's through the story, the narrative, the character, the, like you say, the, the design, the cinematography, um, the music. Um, it feels like something that is specific um, in, in what it's trying to be. And the film doesn't, um, doesn't link too much to the outside Marvel Cinematic Universe. Right. There are characters that pop up, you know, the villain Ulysses Claw, uh, Martin Freeman's Everett Ross. Mm-hmm. We've seen these people before. There's references to Sokovia. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's no talk of Infinity Gems. You know, th- th- there's there's not... Um, uh, it, it's, it's not... The, Kugler is not interested in making an Avengers movie. Yeah. He really wants to show the world why this character and these th- this setting is so f- fabulous. You oh, that's not unlike mm-hmm. Ant Man, though. Ant Man's like that. Doctor uh, I mean, Strange is like that. Y- y- yes. Um, yeah, Doctor Strange has like one reference to uh, Civil War. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Guardians that, of the Galaxy true. is like that. So. I think well, Guardians of the Galaxy is not like that. Guardians of the Galaxy is very much oh, about it's connecting got lots to of Thanos Infinity and stones. all that stuff. Yeah, oh, it's got the stones. And 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 Doctor Strange has you know uh, loose connections That's to the hot. Infinity uh, gems and yeah. um, Ant Man. No, just talk to Segovia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the story of Black Panther, as we have in the film, and listeners, of uh, of course you've already seen the movie, so it's really no need to give a spoiler warning, right? You've already seen it like twice now. Three uh, times? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but for whatever reason, if you were sick and you couldn't get out or you just didn't have it off or you were in jail and you just got out today and you're going to go see it, spoiler warning, okay? We're going to get into spoilers, okay? So if you haven't seen the film, please go listen to it and then come back, go watch it, then come back and listen to us. What if they were waiting for our opinion just to make sure that it mod liked it before? If they've been following our Twitter (laughs) feed and Facebook, they know. If people were waiting for our opinion, it's made my head so much bigger. (laughs) Well, that's probably not true, I know. God damn it. Sorry. (laughs) I build them up just to knock them down. Knock them down. So, (laughs) spoiler warnings, ladies and gentlemen. Um, We're going to get into spoilers. So, with the film, we meet, it takes place timeline-wise... Uh, MCU related. It takes place after the events of Captain America: Civil War. We have a mm-hmm. T'Challa who is returning home to Wakanda from the events of Civil War to his country, and um, because of the events of Civil War and the death of his father T'Chaka, uh, T'Challa is now king. So he's coming home to inherit the throne. And one of the things that has to happen is uh, there's a, a there's a, a ritual that has to happen, a combat um, where someone is given an opportunity to contest the throne and 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 potentially have you know you know get the rights to be uh, crowned king um but also the opening of the film before we even get to that the opening of the film takes place uh in 1992 in oakland california here in the united states and and it's a really interesting opening on your first watch on your second watch or your third watch it it's it's great it's great it all it all makes sense it it, it has so much more to it once you've seen it already uh, but let's talk about the opening of that film I love the opening so mm-hmm. much that starts with a voiceover yeah it it's it, the film starts with a child asking a you know a question of that's, his father that's Eric yeah I know yeah. and that question of you know and and what it is is. Uh, the father is describing Wakanda, where Wakanda came from. There's, it's kind of a, a Lord of the Rings style backstory where you see, uh, you know, the the meteorite from uh, space crash into Africa. That's vibranium. It uh, fe- it becomes the 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 source of all their technology and their power, uh, and how these five tribes uh, settle around the Great Mound. And while the rest of the world is going to hell, Wakanda has secreted itself away from prying eyes, uh, thanks to the technology that they have formed from vibranium, and they're you know that they become this little you know El Dorado, this lost city. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know the father says to the son, you know we've remained hidden, and the son asks why, mm-hmm. and that question is what will. 
torment and torture uh, all the preceding events of this film. Yeah. Um, Lisa, do you want to talk about the opening? Oh, I think that Brad covered it really well. I mean, it was it was beautiful, and the fact that there that is the thesis statement of the movie. Yeah. Why has Wakanda l- lived this way? Can it continue to live this way? What are exactly. the repercussions of being isolated? Why? Right. So on first watch, you don't realize that that is Nojobu talking to Eric as a child, mm-hmm. and it immediately cuts to the Oakland scene where there are these kids mm-hmm. playing basketball outside. And then up in the apartment complex, we find Nujobo, played by Sterling K. Brown, and uh, his right-hand man, James. And they're planning some kind of operation that involves cars and machine guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a knock at the door. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, you hear, the, you hear the ship. You yeah. hear like a, yeah, the, like the a Wakandan UFO sound. Yeah. 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 And, and then, there's, then there's the knock at the door. And James goes to see who it is, peeps through the eye hole, and there's two Grace Jones looking ladies with spears hanging out. And Nijobo uh, says, Well, you better let them in because they're not going to knock twice. Yeah. They come in, they confirm that Nijobo is who he says he is, that he is Wakandan. He's got that blade, you know, lip tattoo yeah. <laughs> um, that proves that he's a, a war dog for Wakanda. And then the lights go out, and when the lights come back on, you see the most badass <laughs> Black Panther suit I have ever seen in my life. Yeah. It's so great. That when we get future iterations of the Black Panther costume, I'm s- kind of missing <laughs> the one from 1992. <laughs> yeah. It's King T'Chaka, yeah. and uh, he's come to find his brother, yeah. uh, who's uh, been a spy uh, for the Wakanda Nation in America, but he has um, fallen. Well, he's been swayed by the plight that he sees in the United mm-hmm. States, uh, and and he's he's sickened by the fact that Wakanda has the ability to help and chooses not to. And uh, he, we learn through T'Chaka's investigation, we learn that James is not who he says he is. He's actually Zuri, another Wakandan war dog spy, and that Njobu has stolen a bunch of vibranium, the precious metal, with the aid of Ulysses Claw, the scumbag Andy Serkis character that we saw in Age of Ultron. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Nujobu is obviously pretty upset by this. Uh, he uh, lashes out, pulls a gun on James, and T'Chaka saves James and in the process impales Nujobu, his brother, with his panther claws. Which, him. which this is saved at, for a later moment in the film as a revelation because yeah. that scene is truncated oh, that's for the opening r- that's right, of the, that's of the right, movie. That's right, right. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. All spoilers. <laughs> So <laughs> after so after that sequence, uh, we have the sequence in present day uh, as T'Challa is about to um, embark on a mission to. Um, uh, he's yeah. in, he's interrupting rescue, a mission. Rescue. Yeah, he's, he's, he's retrieving well, Nakia. Yeah. Yeah, quote unquote, yeah. rescuing Nakia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's talk about that sequence because this one we get a we get a uh, our first glimpse at Okia. As she's flying the ship, mm-hmm. yeah, which is pretty badass, and that she's, uh, I'm assuming she's flying it with her mind, which is just, <laughs> you know, just a, a part of the Wakandan technology mythology for me, like in the film that just had my yeah. imagination going. There's off. some sort of brain interface yeah. there, yeah, which I thought mm-hmm. was cool because I mean they have it for his suit as well, uh, but yeah, so we get we get a glimpse of her, um, and our first uh, glimpse of her and. Uh, I like their exchange uh, on the ship where she tells him, that's where my quote was, don't freeze when you see her, <laughs> um, which was which has a callback later on in the opening, which I thought was really cool. Um, but let's talk about uh, Denai Guerrero in, in the film, because this is our first glimpse at her as a character. So, yeah, she, yeah you go ahead, Brian. Uh, oh, no, I thought she was great. Um, I mean, it, this her introduction as far as this scene, we don't really get... Uh, much as far as like her character per se but we do get as far as like maybe some of her interactions with t'challa and maybe kind of building it's kind of like some of the some of the seeds of their relationships you know especially when he says um you know he doesn't need any help and she gives like that little look (laughs) when she puts her spear when she puts her spear back but um i also love that you really get a sense uh, inside the spaceship you really get a sense um at Hannah Beachler's design, um, some of the Wakandan design of the spaceships and the technology as well, when they're uh, when they're um, 
the looking at the uh, the convoy of of, of uh, trucks and the way that this, some of the technology works um, as far as how they're trying to plan um, to uh, rescue Nakia out of out from this uh, from this convoy. So I love all that. It's, again, right then you're you're doing a lot of world building just even within the space of that of that ship. Um, and then, you know, when he goes down and, uh, and begins to rescue for her, um, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool little action sequence that they have, uh, b- between, um, uh, between, uh, T- T'Challa and, uh, some of those, some of those bad guys. Well, it's also an incredibly important scene where, you know, T'Challa thinks he is, you know, he's retrieving Nakia. She's in trouble. She's, she's gone out to... Uh, infiltrate these slave traders and mm-hmm. you know he's going to come in swoop in rescue everybody and and we're all good but you learn here that Nakia she has l- removed herself from Wakanda and its gifts because she, her calling is to um, yeah be a spy it will yeah well and but her calling is to help others which is not necessarily mm-hmm. the Wakandan way her, she is yeah. in a lot of ways very similar to Nujobu in Oakland, and, and that's why she's refusing to come back. And even you know, and T'Challa's like, "Well, I, I need you to come back. I'd like you to come back." By the way, my dad's dead, and I'm becoming king, and that that's why she finally returns mm-hmm. to. She Wakanda. uses yeah. the word mission, though. Mm-hmm. Like, so do you think she's uh, she's giving herself a mission, like? So she was. I'm guessing she originally was, was a assigned war dog. something. Yeah, I don't know if she was necessarily a war dog, but I, I, I bet you she was originally sent out on a task, but in the process, like Najobu, found her own personal calling. I thought war dog mm-hmm. just meant spy in this thing. Yeah. Right. Then why couldn't she have been a war dog? Well, we spy. don't know for a fact. They okay. never say that. She's never referred to as a war dog within the context of this film. Uh huh. She okay. just she just says that she's not Adora, right? Not a, one of those. Yeah, she's not Adora Mirage. Yeah. I, I think I felt like she was she was on a mission like a I guess like whatever Wakandans do humanitarian like, mission humanitarian mission and 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 she was she had her she knew how she was going to end it, um, but he an uh, emergency came up and he just had to look. I know you're going to do this mission, but my dad just died. I need you to come back to Wakanda. That's how I took the yeah, me too. Yeah, but the Wakandans don't really do humanitarian missions. You know, like like what she's doing is flying in the face of what T'Challa and you know the, the right. rest of the council would want. You know, she she wants she tells him that you know we have the ability to help all these people. We should help these people, and mm-hmm. he interprets that. Look, we don't enforce our will on others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, and yeah. then after that sequence, we go. Do we get Michael? Is that Michael? Oh yeah, and T'Challa totally has the hots for her. They have some kind of history, romantic history. Oh yes, yeah. Which and he causes that causes him to freeze. To freeze. (laughs) She has that power. She has that power over me. I mean, she's stunning. (laughs) (laughs) So then, I I think that's when we're introduced to. um, Well, I think we have the same way actually get to Wakanda, um, and you see the the landscapes of of Wakanda. Because the child says, you know, this this never gets old. And oh, yeah, you see the, the crossing, the, the like honeycomb, yeah. little hologram barrier. Hologram. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so finally seeing Wakanda, Brad. What was what were your thoughts? I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. You know, you, know you, you got glimpses of it in the trailers, and it certainly looked beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but you know it. I want more time in Wakanda. You know, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. My favorite uh, segment of the Golden City in this film is when they get down to the street and you know Nakia and T'Challa are, are walking with a couple of doors behind them, yeah. and you see street vendors and you know you see you know, street musicians and uh, you just get to see the people and you get to see that that blend that you know that Afrofuturism of uh, you know of, of like the tribal clothing with you know, future tech. Yeah. I love using the, like watching, watching videos that like pop up and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the, um, visualization of all the technology was stunning. And, uh, you know, Brian, you were mentioning, uh, that map that, that, that you see in the Panther jet, uh, in Mm. that, that rescue sequence and how it, uh, I don't know, it becomes a 3d, uh, Mm -hmm. model 
uh, and how T'Challa can interact with that model and pick trucks up off of that. I, all well, the you know that's based off real tech. Yeah, nanotechnology. Yeah. Every movie has like agreed that nanotechnology is the next thing, and it probably is the next thing. But it's funny because the way it's interpreted in film is like everything looks like sand. Like you know, uh, mm. Wakandan tech looks like sand when we're on you know. Superman's spaceship. That shit looks like sand. Well, like everything. Well, looks it was like for the stuff looking like sand. It, it really looks like that. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a material, a mineral like that. That when you give it a, a specific type charge. of electric charge, like it takes a, it takes a specific shape, uh, which I just thought was freaking amazing. But I like the look. What I like about the look of Wakanda is because is that like before seeing the film and just going by what I know of Wakanda from comments, and it's the most uh, advanced technologically placed on Earth. So like. Part of me pictures um, like floating cities and like really streamlined buildings and everything like just clean lines and, but then when you see in the film, like you mentioned, Brad, there's a mixture of traditional stuff that bleeds into the future stuff of the future design, and and vice versa. And what I like about that is, you know, it speaks to the idea of, um, you can you can and should have progression and advancement and you should strive for that and but that doesn't mean you have to leave your roots mm. and your traditions and you know your you know what made you behind and so yeah I, I i really because you get a lot of arguments about you know people who don't want to adopt new ideas try new things or, or advance because this is what they grew up this is tradition this is how it's always been done but you can you can not throw all that away and still build towards more and better. And I really like the visualization of that idea with Wakanda. Also, the fact that, like, it establishes, like, this place is built on on this kind of aesthetic. Like, yeah. if you have this kind of aesthetic, then this is what your future ship is going to be shaped like. This is what your, uh, you know, future buildings are going to be shaped like. Yeah. Right. If you've read any interviews with... Hannah Beachler, the production designer, or Ruth Carter, they went out of their way to remove any references to Western culture. They kept it mm -hmm. completely African, like right down to how, you know, T'Challa's Black Panther suit is put, brought together. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's, it, and to the Lisa's point, that's why the film looks so stunningly, radically different than other Marvel movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they so they get to um, Wakanda. They arrive there. We do have that sequence uh, when they step off the the jet. That's when yeah. we meet um, T'Challa's his mother and his sister. Yeah, sure. Uh, he's yeah. so good. Let's talk about that. I mean, th there are so many. Like whenever certain characters come on screen, as you know, Brian was saying with you know Okoya and Dan Denai Guerrero or Lisa with Lupita Nyong'o, whenever they come into the frame, they steal the movie. Mm -hmm. And Letitia Wright s absolutely steals the film. She's so great. As She's Shira. so great. You know, yeah. she, as the sister of T'Challa and also as, like, the big brain of Wakanda. You know, yeah. she's in charge of the, all the science and technology. Uh, and, and we get to see her... Um, her inventions. We get to see her lab. We get to see her brain at play. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just so energetic and exciting to see this youthful exuberance wrapped around all these crazy sci-fi ideas. Yeah. And that sibling, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, push and pull uh, of, yeah. the, of yeah. those two characters, particularly in this scene. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Lisa? Um, for me, what I, I take from this scene is that um, T'Challa is mourning his father he's suffering you know he he carries a lot of guilt because he feels partially responsible for his father's death um but also like his his dad was his moral compass his dad was his his sense of the world and um and now he's going to become king and and that's this tremendous honor and and that's that's the future that he has been anticipating for himself but uh, but part of that is this this sorrow the sorrow of his dad not being present and um his mother comes up to him and and you know embraces him and comforts him that that your dad is is still with us you know even though you know you've lost him he's still with us he's still going to be an active part of our lives 
and how you rule, which I, I think is this idea that goes throughout this film of what kind of role is T'Chaka now going to play now that T'Challa is king? What kind of king will T'Challa be without T'Chaka? Yeah. So. Yeah, and the cool thing about, you know, the Black Panther mythology is that T'Challa can have access still to his father and, and past Black Panthers yeah. uh, through mm-hmm. the ancestral plane. So what are your ideas on how they how they handle the ancestral plane. I mean, this is, this is the element from the comic books that I was looking forward to the most, the necropolis. I know, yeah. and, and like, I was like, this has to happen. You, you cannot have the Black Panther story without uh, the necropolis. Yeah. And um, I, I, I loved the idea of, you take, of taking... Now, I'm jumping, we're jumping ahead a little bit because that's, this is when he gets challenged by M'Baku, happens before this. But after the challenge w- between him and um, M'Baku, uh, they go to the necropolis, and Zuri, the Forrest Whitaker character, gives him the heart-shaped herb, and they bury him in that red sand, and he enters into the a- ancestral plane. It's that shot you've seen from the trailers where T'Challa is walking across a veldt, and there's this tree, and on the tree are these panthers, and you got that gorgeous purple sky, and then the panther drops off of the tree, and there's T'Chaka, and he's able to have a conversation with his dad. You know, Lisa and I were talking about it before you came over, how the differences between uh, this this mm, spiritual conversation versus Thor Ragnarok spiritual conversation between Thor and and Loki, and how and Odin. Uh, sorry, Thor, Loki, and Odin. I mean, do you, do you, did you want to address that oh, a no, little you, bit? I mean, you can talk about it. Uh, to me, so, so what I took from that is we're so used to when we interact with, with people who are either about to die. Like fictionally. Or, or yeah. fictionally, mm-hmm. or about, or past dead, and we're, we're interacting with their spirit, that they, are, they are, ha- have now reached a new plane of wisdom. And, and what they have to say is the core of, of truth from, from their perspective of their lives and all. And, and, but when uh, T'Challa interacts with his father in the ancestral plane, he, his interaction evolves. Like, T'Challa is not changed. T'Chaka is not changed through death. He... Um, his perspective is still limited. So there is a difference between his first interaction with his father and his second. And yeah. then Eric's interaction with his father. Um, T'Challa's second interaction with his father and um, Eric's interaction with his father, they go back to the necropolis and they teach their deceased father something. They bring what their father had taught them, and then they bring a new level of enlightenment to that. And I, I think that one of the main themes of this film is building upon knowledge. And, van- you know, like, you can't depend on, you have to, you know, believe in yourself and, and take what you've learned and, and bring it to the next level. Well, so that, that first conversation, this conversation yes. at the ancestral plane between T'Challa and T'Chaka, T'Challa is saying, look, I'm not ready. And Tataka mm-hmm. is saying, well, have I ever failed you? If, I, if, if you weren't ready to be king, that means I failed you, and I've never failed you. And, and T'Challa says, that's not what I'm afraid of. What I'm afraid of is, you know, I'm not ready f- for you to be out of my life. And, um, you know, th- so that, that conversation there still feels a little bit like the Odin-Loki-Thor conversation. Wise dead dad, offering comfort to his son. Okay, we'll go on and have the rest of the movie. But over the course of this film, what you learn is by go, when what we saw in 1992 Oakland was a tremendous sin committed by mm-hmm. T'Chaka. Yeah. And that what's driving the narrative of this movie is these, these past historic shames, these hidden shames. Mm-hmm. And they have, they have bred a monster. You know, Eric Killmonger is a monster that we created. You know, that he suffered a tremendous loss. He lived 
in, in, in horrible surroundings, uh, and he witnessed the pain of his friends and family, and that is something that we allowed to happen and we ignored, and uh, and and Wakanda allowed that that wound to fester and turn into a villain, and to it's T'Challa encountering Killmonger, seeing and learning of this this murder that occurred, um, the, the, the killing of his uncle, uh, he sees that, you know, maybe this paradise that we have built um, doesn't come without tremendous evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, um, the sin was leaving Eric behind. Mm-hmm. Leave him behind, yeah. And, and um, that becomes an enormous, like, you know, you turn your back on one, you turn your back on right. all kind of idea. Yeah. So after, so we did skip, we skipped a very important uh, introduction, um, and that is M'Baku. So yes. So that, you know, he, he wants to protest um, T'Challa's crowning as king. He wants to... Um, he wants to fight for it in, in combat. Uh, so there's Which, one or two. Which, if he if he had not come out, um, T'Challa's uh, coronation, I guess, mm-hmm. would be unopposed. Yep. Mm-hmm. He um, he had no dissent within the ranks of the the, the yeah. three tribes. Five tribes. Five, four tribes. Oh yeah, four. Yeah. Four tribes who liked to, to hang out together. <laughs> and that and that speaks. I mean, it's a maybe a small thing in the context of maybe the bigger picture of the story or the narrative. But as far as creating uh, a, a character, a, a fully realized character in T'Challa of Black Panther, and I don't mean just for this movie, but I mean for an audience member, for a young person, for a kid, a person of color, or any color, whatever, when they see T'Challa, to be able to see that much respect from those people that, you know what, do we respect you too much? I, we're not going to contest you. You deserve to be the king. For me, as an audience member, that that's just that's such a big deal to be able to respect someone so much and be so, you know, and be so giving and saying, you know what, we're, we're going to congratulate you. We're not going to hate on you. You deserve this. You know, you 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 earned this. You should. You, we're not going to we're not going to contest you. And I got for me, like I thought that was such. A big deal. It's a small thing that says so much about T'Challa. But at the same time, in that scene, that's when you also learn that all things in Wakanda are not equal, and that the Jabari tribe, who live in the mountains, uh, and don't experience the wealth and the technology of the vibranium, who are this wood-based culture, that there yeah. is animosity there, mm-hmm. and that that challenge is very important in in shaping the rest of T'Challa's arc and, mm-hmm. and opening up his worldview beyond the throne room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. at, at that time, at that point in the story, um, T'Challa represents a status quo, mm-hmm. that, that there is a, a huge level of contentment within most of Wakanda, the Wakanda that lives within the city, and, um, and T'Challa descended from T'Chaka, is, is going to maintain the status quo, um, which uh, through the course of the story, you know, this, you know. Must change. Ha- en- ends up having to change. So, because mm-hmm. as soon as all of this, you know, animosity starts getting stirred up, oh, well then um, all, all of a the sudden there is all of this get discontent and these tribes are, are now at war, mm-hmm. you know. How about that M'Baku, Brian? What did you think of uh, Winston Duke's uh, portrayal, his introduction, all that good stuff? I loved it. I, I love, I mean, M'Baku might be one of my favorite characters uh, from the film. I mean, he was uh, ferocious. He was funny. Um, you understand his point of view from the from the opening uh, narration as far as the Jabari tribe uh, not accepting this new technologically advanced society and going up into the mountains. And then when you see um, the Jabari tribe come into uh, the waterfall for the uh, for the ritual combat, and even his speech uh, uh, prior to uh, the fight. I mean, he makes a lot of sense, you know. When the of course, from the Jabari standpoint of them, you know, 
relinquishing a lot of their te technology, like you said, to Shuri and the fact that um, T'Challa couldn't even protect his own father, but yet you want to you want to pronounce this man as the king. He was like, you know, this is our chance to really step forward and show show the people of Wakanda who the Jabari tribe, who who they really are. And um, I don't know. I, I just I liked everything about Mbaku, and then of course there there were. They had conflict in their relationship, but there was also something as we saw later in the film when everything kind of changed when um, when Killmonger came in. Uh, I just I, I like the dynamic between their relationship between Mbaku and uh, T'Challa um, and how that kind of grew from uh, the beginning of the film and where it ended up towards the end of the film. I think there's a lot of respect there because exactly because yeah. of you know they're both leaders of their tribe, um, but also the fact that um, they both are honorable. You know, T'Challa did not finish M'Baku. M'Baku now has this this debt, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. that there's a lot of, of honor and, and respect there. Th there the is. the process and, and the ritual. There and is. And, and one of the things as far as, like, respect, you see that in very minimal dialogue, even in the fight, when he has him pinned and they're at the edge of the waterfall, he's telling Mbako to give in. And he says something to him. He was like, he's like, don't make me kill you. He was like, your people need you. Mm -hmm. And just that line itself shows you um, the type of man T'Challa is, that he's, he understands, you know, that the Jabari tribe, they need M'Baku. And it's like, he doesn't want to kill him because of that level of respect that they have. Even though they do have their differences, uh, there, is that, there is that respect there. And that'll contrast later with his interactions with um, Eric Killmonger because Eric Killmonger is so angry and so hurt that he, mm -hmm. he puts, that as, puts that aside. I mean, exactly. he, yeah. like, Killmonger needs to to tell to make his story complete. Killmonger either needs to be king or needs to be dead. He can't live yeah, yeah. any other way. Yeah. I think that Winston Duke is like a tremendous find. Like all he's done before this yeah. film is TV, right? And he yeah, has like such a tremendous, TV. Hmm, a tremendous presence, a charisma, really funny. Like the the <laughs> to be funny and just utterly intimidating like it's just exactly. he's just so great i mean your quote from from the uh opening of of this episode brian like that moment is just so great <laughs> uh, it's it's awesome yeah that whole sequence is just awesome yeah he's he's still i mean just like what you said brad it's like all the surrounding characters and peripheral characters when they're on screen they steal the scenes they steal their moments um it's, it's awesome well what black panther is doing as a film is opening the possibilities of what the mcu could be exponentially like yeah. now i could watch an entire mbaku film i could watch a <laughs> shuri movie yeah. you know i i could certainly watch a dora milaje movie you know yeah. and like like I, I think there's just tremendous story potential uh, it, uh, thanks to this the, to this film. Yeah. So yeah. we have to talk about Eric uh, now because at this point in the story, we meet him as an adult. Yeah, and he's uh, um, he's in an art museum in Britain. Right. Oh, the scene's so yeah. Great. And you know he's he's uh, attracted the attention of one of the you know museum curators, and he's testing her, saying like, "Oh, where's that mask from? Oh, where's that mask from? <laughs> oh, how about this uh, axe? Where's where's that from?" And, that's me in Best Buy all the time. <laughs> uh, Eric Killmonger at Best Buy. <laughs> and actually, that's an Intel Four. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir. Yeah, okay. and, and you know, she's like, "Well, this is from uh, the Benai tribe. I probably have that mistaken." And uh, she certainly did because he's able to spot that it's it's actually uh, a Wakandan. Uh, uh, artifact made from vibranium, and don't worry, I'm going to take this off your hands. And she's like, "Oh, no, none of this is for sale." I was like, "Yeah, but how'd you get it? <laughs> you didn't go down this, to the market and purchase any of this stuff, so I'm just going to take it from you." And uh, he's poisoned her coffee. She falls into uh, uh, arrest, 
and he, here comes the ambulance team to, to help out. And, of course, that ambulance team is Claw's goons, and they just slaughter <laughs> everybody in the museum, uh, uh, or at least that wing, and uh, they take they take the vibranium axe. He has, like, a, Eric has, like, a, a Bonnie to his Clyde, this yeah, young woman uh, yeah. who is... Yeah. Who Does she he seems even give to be passionate the about. They're they're definitely like uh uh yeah, like you said, a Bonnie and Clyde, a Mickey and Mallory type couple. Uh he he definitely gets excited in in, in the thrill of the of the capture, uh or the retrieval of that axe, and you can see them making out in the back of that ambulance as they speed away. Yeah. But uh he doesn't really have any true feelings for her, as it turns out. Or not no. he doesn't have any unexpendable feelings yeah. for her. <laughs> so yeah. that that scene in the gallery when um Andy Circus she takes that one hostage and says, "Come here, come here. I'm gonna let you live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I promise, don't tell anybody." And then he shoots the. <laughs> Lisa, did you say that's so funny? It was fucking. It was funny. It, it was, was funny yesterday funny. when he shot that guy funny. in the back. Like people just erupted, and I don't know how I feel about that. Like, cause <laughs> I, I get why you're laughing, because yeah, it's kind of funny. But then you realize what just happened, like what he it's just did. It's terrible. To that guy? I mean, it's terrible. So it just, I just something I just noted yesterday. Circus when I was watching is. It portrayal of Claw. Like, let's take a moment just to appreciate Circus in this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, he was awesome. He's amazing. He is funny in a diabolical way, but he's also really, really scary. Later Mm -hmm. on, when he's captured and uh, brought into the interrogation, and and he's doing that song rendition of, What is love? (laughs) Like, it is hilarious, but it's also tremendously disturbing and unnerving. And I just yeah. think Circus kills it. Every person involved in Black Panther kills it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He is the, also the true embodiment of just pure racism in this film. Like his entire, his entire motivation, justification for taking the vibranium is because he believes that he black people don't deserve it. That they're savages. That they're savages. Yeah. And yeah. the only reason they are where they are is because of this vibranium that that and and they would not be nothing without it. Yeah. So so that makes him f- very frightening. Right. He's really the only pure evil character in the movie. And the fact that he is taken out so unceremoniously well, and I okay. So is, we're ju- we're jumping ahead yeah, again, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. when he is killed, and and he dies just before or just after uh, Killmonger reveals his you know blade tattoo that he is also a Wakandan. When he realizes that that Killmonger is Wakandan, and he goes like, oh, I just thought you were some stupid American, you know, Cretan, and like he dies in the most pathetic and, and, and laughable way. Which but it just himself. makes it so tremendously sad that the CIA is, like, the CIA t- is not entitled to this vibranium <laughs> fucking either. You know what I mean? So, so like, a, you know, that, that, con- that interaction with this pure evil, well, I'm not stealing the vibranium. I'm right. buying the vibranium, yeah, right. so that yeah. somehow well, makes it okay. It goes back to the scene at the museum, right? Mm-hmm. Where let's admire all these beautiful artifacts. Speaking <laughs> of speaking of his death scene, uh, Claw's death mm-hmm. scene. Did you notice the callback to the scene that we were just talking about moments ago when he shot the guy in the back? That's why uh, I was bringing it. I, up. I missed it. No, what? So when I was the first time I watched the movie, like that scene happens and shoots the guy in the back. Then the rest of the movie happens. Then the part that Aunt Brad is talking about is. Ulysses Claw is held captive. Uh, Killmonger busts in, b- b- takes him out of there, so mm-hmm. helps him escape, only to bring him out somewhere and kill him. So the first time I was watching it, I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why well, didn't he just kill him right there? Do you, do you know the callback? Well, so when he shot the guy, when, he shot, when Andy Serkis shot the guy, he's like, man, why didn't you just kill him right there? Uh-huh. You got to spread it out, yeah. And Andy Serkis said, oh, well, you know, he spread the crime scene out. All right, right. Like Is that an face. actual callback, though, later on, do you think? Well, they, well, why did he do that, though? Because, well, they needed to get well, back I mean, to the, the plane, and he needed his it, body to take back to Wakanda. He could have killed him when he busted in the wall. He could have killed him right there. 
All he needed was the body, right? He busted I mean, in the wall. By by busting in there and having his future corpse walk out with him is makes it easier for him. If he had if he killed him right then on the spot, he'd have to collect the body. He would lose an arm in holding up that corpse. I mean, just from a practical standpoint, yeah. I don't think he's like well, he could have mm-hmm. killed him in the truck too. Well, yeah, that's that's true, but then you don't have a hold on the scene. Who's going to drive to the plane? Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but he. But oh and, yeah, and, you go ahead, Brian. Was he originally no, planning to Brian, kill him don't. there, though? <laughs> You know, where at or at the at that airfield? Yeah, because he was gonna say like you could just drop me off in Wakanda. <laughs> like he probably would have killed him right then at the doorstep of Wakanda. Oh, <laughs> he was gonna die either way. Then, That's I guess. true. Yeah, uh, Andy Serkis was great in in the film. Yeah. Uh, and is and huge. Is is that how he's yeah. like as a character in the comic books? Brad Claw. Uh, I, I mean, mean, I know he's, he's like physically he's yeah, like he's a whole different he's, thing, but I mean like well he's def- no he's he's a um, you know a, a, a racist uh, white supremacist yeah. who definitely feels entitled to all things and uh, he is way crazier looking yes in yeah. the comic books yeah <laughs> so Eric Killmonger does eventually so we're introduced to him in that scene in that sequence um, and it's established that through this sequence but also through flashbacks and later on in the story that you know he's he's upset that you know Wakanda has closed off its walls to the suffering that he's seen out in the world kind of like you mentioned like um um not Shuri what's her what's her name Nakia uh, N- 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 Nakia Lupita Nyong'o's character, character? yeah mm-hmm. yeah like yeah. her like she's been out she's seen things and so you know he wants to bring Ulysses Claw back and because he's also because re- Ulysses Claw is responsible for the death of T'Chaka and he wants to uh, he wants contention of the throne. But he's not responsible for the death of T'Chaka he's th- responsible for the death of Wakabi's family well, well yeah and that, that's why I wanted to double back to because yeah, we haven't Cl- talked about uh, Daniel Kaluuya Right, Claude didn't have it. Wasn't in Civil War. He was in Age of Ultron. Yeah. Sure? Yeah, I'm 100 percent sure. Yeah. It was, yeah, he, it was Baron uh, um, Nemo. That's right. Zemo. Nemo. Sorry, yeah, Nemo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Baron Nemo there, uh, yeah. who, who who killed That's T'Chaka. Right. That's right. But um, yeah, the but the character of Wakabi, because um, we haven't talked about the South Korea um, sequence as well. Oh but God, Wakabi, yeah. like that moment when they're in the um, the the throne room, I guess is what you want to call it, and they they get a tip on where uh, Ulysses Claw is going to be, uh, is going to make this deal in South Korea. We'll also uh, get reintroduced to um, Everett Ross, but we also learn about Wakabi and what happened to his family and how his family got killed by the hands of Claw originally when he uh, took the vibranium um, 30 odd years ago. And so he, T'Challa promises him, he, t- he promises Wakabi i be like, look, like you kill him where you stand, or you bring him back here to Wakanda, and he makes that promise to him. Um, but then ultimately, he fails in that promise, uh, which also I think gives Daniel Kaluuya um, a nice storyline, oh, yeah. a nice story arc uh, that we see play out towards the end of the film. Um, but yeah, that's, I thought I definitely wanted to mention him as well. Mm-hmm. So Daniel Kaluuya, talk. Let's talk about his character of Wakabi. We were all happy. Seeing Daniel on the big screen yes. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good seeing that guy work. Yeah. You know, I, th- I think he's a, a fascinating character. As Brian was saying, you know, he, because of this, like Killmonger, he has this pain that has been growing inside him since he was a child. Mm. And he was hoping that his best bud, T'Challa, was going to help him, you know, s- s- solve that pain. You know, wanted, mm-hmm. let's take out Claw, let's get rid of Claw. And there's that also that conversation where the two of them have um, back at uh, Wakabe's tribe's homes, homestead where we see mm-hmm. the war the rhino. rhinos. Yeah. Uh, that Wakabe is like, look, you know, if you, we we don't want refugees coming in here. You know, Nakia is like, hey, if there are people who need help, bring them on into our borders. We'll help. We'll take care of them. And Wakabe doesn't want any of that. That will just disrupt everything. Yeah. But if you want me and my army to go out into the world and clean things up, yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. And so, so Wakabe and Killmonger, they become natural, you know, allies. Yeah. Uh, they're they're very like minded in their their point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think Kalua, that was like a big surprise. So Wakabe in the comics 
is a like just a, another sidekick character. He's got this cyborg arm. You know, he, he's just another badass. Yeah, uh, I was extremely uh, surprised and thrilled to see how complicated Kaluuya's character ended up being. You know, I was worried he was just going to be a practically a cameo, but he has a full mm-hmm. arc uh, in within this film. In the comics, does he have this the same type of relationship with uh, um, Okoye? No, well, no. Uh, Okoye and Akia aren't really found in the comics. There are versions, uh, there are characters that are similar yeah. to them, but but these are very much uh, Kugler creations. Yeah. I appreciated that. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. great. They yeah. st- again, everybody steals the show, but whenever they are, they yeah. definitely do. So at this point, Eric, uh, he ends up getting a hold of Claw. Oh, we have. To, I guess we do have to talk about. We have to go back to South Korea and talk about. Yeah, the South sequence. Korea. Sequence. Oh my god! Yeah, the casino. Yeah. Yeah. That so. was one of the clips we got to see it at Comic Con. Oh my god! That yeah. just got us so excited about the action in this film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, from the action standpoint, this is certainly the highlight of the movie. Yeah. Um, you, you know, they infiltrate this gambling den because uh, uh, they know that the vibranium sale is going to occur. Uh, T'Challa immediately spots uh, Everett Ross, the Martin Freeman character, and they're all just waiting for uh, Claw to come in and, oh, you know, well, we don't want to shoot out, we don't want to shoot out, but we know there's going to be a shootout. Yeah. <laughs> and when it finally goes down and it really becomes, you know, uh, I- inside the gambling den, Chadwick Boseman gets to punch a few dudes. Yeah. But it's really Denai Guerrero's uh, show yeah. And, yeah. and Lupita Nyong'o. But... And 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 deny you know, she comes in. She's wearing this wig. She's undercover, you yeah. know. And she just hates this infernal wig. Yeah. And when it's time for her to kick ass, and she whips that off and throws it in the face, and then out comes her spear, and it's yeah. And, and also um, the score when it kicks yes. off oh. her. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. Badass. It's yeah. so good. It's so good. Yeah, so that and she's in that red dress and she's hopping from the second floor to the first floor and it acts like a cape and yeah, yeah it, it's stunning. It's Both stunning. of their dresses are are um, beautiful and action ready. Like yeah. you know, Lupita Nyong'o's dress with the enormous slits up both sides and she's like running she can drive like i'm like wow a skirt you can drive in that is some (laughs) sweet tech right there you can't drive in normal skirts (laughs) yeah that's impossible what it's impossible yeah i'm gonna do a myth buster i'm gonna (laughs) skirt and i'm gonna try to drive in the skirt and then you know claw escapes he makes it rain by blowing up the, (laughs) the 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 all the chips with his sonic cannon arm, which I love seeing the sonic cannon arm on screen. I love how mm-hmm. gross it is. <laughs> like, just like when That's his so hand weird. slits yeah. open, it's like, ugh, it's gross, just like him. It feels like a Del Toro creation. Yeah. Um, and then, so they, you know, they flee, and it's uh, Nikki and Akoya that are in hot pursuit while, he, while I guess, you know, T'Challa is still uh, punching a couple guys. And, the, you know, like, oh, should we wait for T'Challa? No, he'll catch up. Well, he got hit with that sonic blast. Though. Oh, that's right, that's right. So he was probably shaking it off. <laughs> yeah. So they pursue in their vibranium car, and this... So, like, I was enjoying the punch-up and, and the ass-kicking inside the gambling den, but this is when it goes to the next level for me, the car chase. Mm-hmm. So you've got Nikia and Okoya in the vibranium car, and they've thrown this device on a, on a parked, mm-hmm. unmanned yeah. vehicle that allows Shuri to pilot from... Remotely pilot? Re, yeah, remotely pilot from her lab in Wakanda as Black Panther, now in his new suit, because yeah. we learned that, that Shuri had the Q developed scene. it. Yeah. yeah, she had released yeah. uh, like the cue of the, of the franchise. And, <laughs> and Black Panther now jumps on, he's riding on top of the car, yeah. and it's hot pursuit, and that scene is the best. That's just a badass concept, like... That, that that's girl awesome, yeah. thought of that te- created that technology to do that. Like that's just amazing. And the joy that she has yeah. behind the wheel. Yeah, she gets so excited. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so And then I guess I, I, I will take this moment to just talk about the new uh, Panther suit. Hmm? It's a really it's a it's a relatively recent design. It's based on the B- Brian Stelfreeze uh, mm. version of the character from the Tanahisi Coach run that's currently on. This idea that the vibranium suit can absorb the impact kinetic of, energy yeah, of of bullets or 
kicks or explosions or whatever, and then re uh, distribute redistribute mm -hmm. that energy as in a, a badass punch or a, a sonic boom moment. Yeah. And when he's absorbing that energy, the design this this purple lattice. Uh, runs throughout the entire suit mm -hmm. and he gets more and more purple the more and more hits he get, takes mm -hmm. and it kind of acts as like this ticking clock of like oh when is T'Challa gonna go off yeah loved seeing that on screen yeah yeah mm -hmm. that was awesome uh, I, but I have to admit I do like the face mask of the original Black Panther suit better though I also agree with that's you that's a badass I, yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. yeah so if you could just put like the the kinetic energy sucking feature into like the first suit then I'll take that. I agree with Please. you. And, you know, the convenience of not having to put your helmet on. She makes an excellent point. Goes into sure the necklace. Does. That's just so bad. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's so badass. So, anyway, so we have that sequence, uh, the chase sequence that ends when, uh, oh, we've got to talk about her hopping up on top of the car. That shit was so bossed. <laughs> oh, throws yeah. throws a spear, and it goes through the back window, out of the front, in front of the car, the truck, and smashes it. Yeah. That's that was so bad. The best. Then the the scene when <laughs> when she comes to a screeching halt, and then she's right like th skating on the on the hood of the car, and then um, Lupita Nyong'o yeah. comes like in her little seat, <laughs> like that kid, like the the last screening I saw that killed the audience. Oh, the one with Sia, man, that they thought that was the funniest shit in the world. It was My so favorite move in that whole scene is T'Challa hanging off the side of the car. Clawing the ground with his vibrating oh, yeah. talons, yeah, to make a turn. and making the turn happen, and then he hops onto the car and does that little spin onto the hood. Yeah, Woo! gift that forever. <laughs> 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 so at this point, this is uh, this is when so Claw gets away uh, at that point, um, and no, they no. Oh, well, Claw gets captured at the end of that action sequence. Yes, yeah, the interrogation room. Oh, that's right. Gets, that's uh, right. Because they blow the chair. Okay. Right. And and then again, from a design standpoint, when T'Challa uh, blows up um, Claw's car and Claw comes crawling out of it, you get the Jack Kirby Black Panther eyes, where the eyes actually lift up so you can see the face Bam. beneath the mask. Yeah. Um, I I remember seeing it in posters and going, well, that doesn't. That's not how that suit works in the. Civil War, yeah. a, but then, uh, then seeing it in, in in this film, I just it, it only happens once, but I lo I, lo I love that feature. Yeah, mm. and so when uh, Claw is captured, uh, he's his giddy maniacal self. Um, he's saying, uh, "Show me mercy to the king," because there are people watching, mm -hmm. um, and he plays that up. And then we get the interrogation room sequence, and then we get the uh, escape sequence when he's bro broken out by Killmonger. Um, then one important thing oh. about the interrogation scene is just the reestablishment that Ross believes that Wakanda is a third world country. That's really important because he's CIA. His business literally is knowing shit. Mm -hmm. And then um, Claw is telling him, you know, Wakanda is this amazing place with all of this technology all built from vibranium and Ross is like what and then when he confronts um T'Challa about it T'Challa's like who are you gonna believe I am clearly more handsome that's not how he argues <laughs> it but that I'm that's how he could sell it to me yeah. and and um and, and that's very important to how Ross plays into this story of the revelation of even people who are in the business of knowing do not know Wakanda. I think that's really important. And also during that escape, that's when T'Challa sees uh, his grandfather's ring around the neck of Killmonger mm. and realizes something else is going on with this character. And also, Ross gets a bullet in the spine. Oh yeah, and they bring and they bring Ross to Wakanda so that uh, sure he can have another white boy to fix. <laughs> that's actually also my approach to dating. <laughs> what? <laughs> Just that, another white exactly boy to fix? That's exactly what I say. say like, oh, hooray. Another white boy to fix. All right. Wow. I didn't know that about you. I've done been fixed. <laughs> snip. <Yep>. Snip. <laughs> oh. So at this point, uh, that's when um, Killmonger drags uh, Claw to Wakanda and challenges, yeah. um, and challenges T'Challa. So let's talk about, we have to talk about that sequence, which... This thing had, like, so 
Like, he beat the hero, like, fair and square. He beat the hero fair Not and square. Not technically. T'Challa never gave up. Technically, he never tapped out. He just fell off the side. Well, it was... Toss off the he side of a cliff. Side, yeah. But he was given a magical flower, which gave him, brought him back to life, right? No, no, well, no, no. He wasn't dead. He was in a coma. He, he, First yeah, a coma, a light coma. He was going to die without the heart shaped herb. Yeah. yeah. He was going to die. Granted. So, I mean, I love that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, yeah. from, a, from a, a villain standpoint, even a hero standpoint, like, that's unique in that. My, like I've said it before, my pet peeve is when like the hero always beats the bad guy because of something at the last minute, something that's laying around or some upper hand. Yeah, so the idea is, you know, before these challenges happen, Zuri, the, the, the high priest, uh, gives uh, some potion that temporarily reduces the panther of his ability. Mm, strip, his, yeah, strips, yeah. Their, strips their power away. Right. And they have a, a mano a mano fight where they're both on equal footing. And when they were both on equal footing, yeah, T'Challa got his ass handed to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And but like my, like uh, Killmonger said, he's waited his entire life. Like he's killed people in Afghanistan, Iraq, people, uh, his own brothers and sisters in his own country, just for that moment. So you got to think like, and you feel it uh, watching that scene that he has waited his entire life to kill T'Challa. Well, does he, does it, shouldn't it be he waited his entire life to kill whoever's Black Panther at the moment? Because, uh, like, well, really, whoever's, whoever's because if king. T'Chaka hadn't been killed, like, in Civil War. Yeah, I like, think that's what he's saying, though, basically. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that, if that was Brian was saying. Oh. Yeah, that was like what a, Brian was saying. Well, yeah, I mean, whoever the king, because he wants the throne, so it's whoever right. has the throne. So, right. yeah, T'Challa has the throne at that time. And, you know, before the challenge, when he confronts the leaders of the... F- Four tribes, because Jubar, uh, because uh, uh, Mubaku's not there. He wasn't there. He, you know, he says, "Look, you guys are all sitting pretty in this palace. Mm-hmm. You don't know what's happening beyond your borders, and there are people who look just like you. And this is Africa. We all come from this place. You need to help your brothers and sisters out. And I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and and you know that that idea." You know, when you're listening to Killmonger, you're going, he's making some pretty good points here, people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that's, yeah. that's the brilliance of, of the entire film, really. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, that, it just helps to make such a well-rounded and fully fleshed out, not only villain, but character, period. Yeah. And that, you know, he's not, he's not doing it just because he wants to rule the world or he's power hungry. It may be a combination of multiple reasons why he's doing it, but... There, he's a multifaceted person. His, yeah. But the reasons, most of the reasons why he's doing it are noble reasons. He sees other people out here who could benefit from... Because that's a question that I've asked myself regarding Wakanda. And also, when I think about mm-hmm. Tony Stark, I'm like, all the technology that this dude has laying around in this garage, I mean, there could be people out there who could be benefiting from like all this stuff. Like, why doesn't he do that like why isn't the world like made a better place by the things that th- they can do and so that's something mm-hmm. that i think about from time to time when i think about like i say either tony stark or even wakanda way before black panther was a movie i always thought about it but this yeah, movie addresses that, that like we, we you have a yeah. you have a a a a, 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 con, a, con, a place that can if you get shot in the back and normally what would be paralyzed a person would be paralyzed by our our medical capabilities it's nothing. It's it's a laughable it's a laughable affliction to have. Like you just oh you got shot in the back. I can cure that here. Like that country, that place could do wonders for the world. And but this is the type of world where you know special people are afraid to come out because you know a Superman can't be Superman because you know. well in Wakanda's case the outside world is a grotesque. Well, that's what right? I'm saying. Yeah. But 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 no. But what I'm saying is there are, there's beauty in the outside world. But there are people in the outside world. That will that and that's the interesting thing for me in the future films is how does the world react to having Wakandan technology? Well, I think that there yeah. is going to be some. How does Wakanda react to having refugees? You know, and like suddenly we're now helping people we didn't help before, and like so much of Wakanda, so much of T'Chaka's reign. That's the great sin, right? Is keeping it hidden, keeping it secret. Wakanda forever. We're the only people that matter on this planet. The, the people within our within our walls. Right, and I, I, I love what that says about, like I said, wh- where we are uh, in our 
in our society today. You look at a country like the United States, which mm -hmm. is the richest country in America, all these resources, the land of opportunities. We have all this technology. We have stuff that's advanced beyond other countries. But we want to build walls and keep everybody right. out. We don't want to. We don't want to worry about other countries. Oh, we need to take care of our own problems before we can take care of other countries. We're like, you know, in a way, like Wakanda. You, the U.S. Oh, can is, is an allegory for Wakanda, and I, I and I like what that says about, you know, what are our responsibilities if we mm -hmm. have, when we have, no matter what it is, when you have, period, whether it's technology, whether you have fighting skills, whether you have money, whether you have knowledge, what are your responsibilities at that point? to another human being. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like what that what that the movie proposes in that regard. Brian, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. What do you want? What do you want? Did I hang up on you, Brian? Hello? Yeah. Hi, Brian. No, I'm here. Hello? Okay, I said I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it sounded like you nah, were cut I can, off. I can hit. Brian. Yeah, uh, you're going in and out a little bit. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Because that was watching the fi watching the film, um, uh, even Thursday night, uh, coming out of it. That was one of the things that I thought about was like that conflict. Because you really understand Killmonger's point of view. Um, it's t it, 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 he's right, but in a twisted kind of way because it also makes you question Wakanda's responsibility um, globally in the world. Have a responsibility to provide aid and refuge and refuge to a lot of countries that don't have the technology and the, and the advancements that they have. But then Killmonger comes in and says, "Look, you know, you guys have all this. You guys are sitting pretty, and you know, th this stuff that needs to be done around the world to help other people that look just like you." But of course, he's looking in a way where it's he's looking at just the weaponry of it. He he wants to give weapons to all the war dogs and, well, and stuff. Yeah, sorry. Oh no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, the, the fact that he has the knowledge of Wakanda and an American worldview is really what makes him dangerous because true, from his true. perspective is, well, you know, the people who have are not going to give it away. So the only way to get it is take to take it. it. And I'm a human yeah. being. I'm entitled to rights and comforts and all of that stuff. And um, so he has, and because of his military training t to destabilize regimes, you know, he, he um, has been trained by America to, to take resources mm -hmm. to, to fight, you know, he, to, to take what is needed. And, and, you, yeah. and, and he is someone with a knowledge of Wakanda, he, that's a, a terrible what, knowledge. What, like what, that's a lot what, to deal it, with. It is as a as a black man, mm -hmm. and he and he grew up in the United States. He grew yeah. up as a black man in America, and then he knows of a place where I don't even have to deal with this shit. But I gotta put up with this shit. Like I come from greatness, and you know I'm here. Yeah, like that's mm -hmm. yeah. that's got to be like the hardest thing. That's got to be the hardest thing. And and, and and when you talk about that character, if you just want to think about on your own, like as far as backstory with that character or what made him that person that we see in that museum uh, exhibit when we first meet Eric Killmonger as an adult. Like, it's not hard to think about that. Like, if Eric Killmonger grew up in our United States, mm -hmm. look what that does to a, a, a non-Wakandan black man who doesn't have any ties to anything like that. Like, so if someone had that frustration and then went out and had that aggression and then that drive and that passion to do something about it in that way, like, Eric seems like a totally realistic, in real world context, he seems like a totally realistic villain. Yeah, uh, the the type of dis disillusionment and, um, yeah. Man, so I don't know. That's I I like the fact that this movie did not sugarcoat any of the the issues. Like mm. they go, the streets were flooded with drugs. Black people are over incarcerated. It just like laid it out there in a in a way that you're just like Disney. This is a Disney film, <laughs> and you're, we're seeing um, slavery depicted. We're seeing um, current event issues like uh, social commentary issues discussed openly. Was just really like profoundly moving and shocking. Yeah. Yeah. In a Disney film. In a Disney film, yeah. 
in a, in a superhero comic book movie. Comic that, book movie. The, the bane of a lot of people's existence, but <laughs> there, there, there is value to them. And Black mm-hmm. Panther speaks that in That's volumes. That's what I'm saying. Disneyland, volumes. open your doors. You've got castles and shit. Spread your rides around. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait to go to Wakanda land. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, man. Yeah. Yes, that'd, that'd be awesome. I'm just going to go there and take dresses. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're gonna so, be dress monger. So we, we, we have we have the we have the confrontation between uh, T'Challa and, and Killmonger in which T'Challa loses. Um, at this point in the story, like what are, what are your thoughts on how are you feeling at that? Point? I did not see I did not see uh, Black Panther dying in this movie. Well, I mean, I don't think he's dead at that point. Like anytime you see somebody fall from a distance, especially if they're falling into water, you know he's okay. Yes, yeah. he may have had his power stripped from him. He's still a superhuman. Okay? But when I was watching that movie, I, I had no idea how long Black Panther was going to be gone. And the first watch, it felt like a long time. It is a significant amount of time. And I love how, you know, Nakia knows immediately, oh shit, T'Challa's dead. Uh, Shuri, Ramonda, we gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and they, yeah. They, they, they are secreted off. They go grab Ross and they flee. And... You know, Nakia wants Akoya to come with her, but Akoya is, is duty bound. You know, yeah. she's Dormalaji. Mm-hmm. She's the general. Yeah. All right. She serves the king, and the king now yeah, serves the throne. Is Killmonger. I um. Yeah. I like. God, I'm still thinking about stuff. The stuff still uh, becoming apparent to me about that movie. Um, but I lo- I love that moment with um Okoye's character because uh, another point of conflict where you see both sides um you know i baby you better come on man you got to come help me you know we got to make sure everything's okay i look you're my you're my friend uh brad and lisa but i work here this is i you know, I'm, <laughs> I, you know I, 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 I swore an oath i gotta but, but darren there's a there's a there, you know ricky o is playing right now forget your lessons so so the <laughs> thing that the thing that i just drew a parallel to when i was thinking about that was the fact that, you know, when I joined the military, um, there, there are many reasons why many people join the military. And then once someone joins the military, whether they'll admit it or not, they're fighting for different reasons. Some of them are, are fighting for the flag. Some of them are fighting for a person, the love of their country, the love of themselves, whatever, kicks, whatever. But for me, like the reasons why I was doing it, even though I didn't agree with where I was and what was going on, I was just there for me personally. I was serving the guys that were next to me to make sure my job was to make sure they got home. So, but being bound, being torn by a sense of duty and a sense of, you know, obligation is something that I struggle with as a service member because, you know, there's the, the, the acts of violence. There's the, you know, just, just that, that, that life period. And so I, I don't know, that was a thing that just struck, 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 struck me thinking about her um, being loyal to the throne, but also being torn because, you know, I, my heart goes with you, um, but I can't, I can't leave. Right. And she, it, and it, it is really not a personal thing because not only did she tell them that, but later on at the end of the film with uh, Wakabi. Wakabi, you know, she tells him too, like, babe, I love you, but I'll kill you in a heartbeat over this country. Like, and so the the idea of someone having so much commitment um, to something, being so dedicated to something, um, I just think is so so profound to me. Yeah, and well, Wakanda is bigger is bigger than the throne. Yeah, and and just as important as who is sitting on the throne, it is the rituals, it is the structure that that keeps Wakanda together, and the Dormilaje are part of that. Yeah, but what I like so much about this film is that every character has a point of view that 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 is unique. Like, Nakia's point of view of what you just expressed, Darren, is different than Okoye's point mm-hmm. of view. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, and T'Challa says, like, I want, I'm asking you to, you know, to serve my country, and mm-hmm. she says, so, I'm, so. I'm going to save this country, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and I love how Nakia's point of view and Okoye's point of view and Wakabe and Killmonger and T'Chaka are all influencing T'Challa. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and T'Challa is absorbing so much information and experience over the course of this movie. You see how 
you know, jumping ahead again, when we get to the mid credit sequence or the final scene that we already talked about in the movie, we, you know, we see how T'Challa got to that point yeah. by experiencing all these people. Yeah. It's like a microcosm of what it, what, it, what he's going to have to deal with as king P- forever, as, as long yeah. as he's un, unruled. Yeah. Because you have everyone who, as far as your people, they're all unique personalities. They're all going to want different things, different tribes, different customs and stuff like that. And you have to be able to navigate that. And T'Chaka knows it's going to be hard for, for T'Challa. You know, yeah. he, he says in that first ancestral plane sequence, you know, you're a good man and it's hard to be a king as, as a good man. So you're going to need a bunch of people around you yeah. to talk it out. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but I think that the fact that T'Challa is a, a king and the fact that ultimately everything does come down to him, I think that we're going to see some real darkness in his character in the future as repercussions of... His decision. His decision to open up the borders. I think that, that he's going to end up in a real dark place real quick. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, I mean, and, and that only makes sense because if, if we truly want to define him as a great person, well, we have to have stuff like and that. And we have to challenge out. the ideal, right? That's yeah. like the... You know, well, because we, of the fact that um, the, the downsides of opening up the border are not wrong. You yeah. know, refugees are going to come in, and yeah. that's going to be hard, and people are going to have feelings about that. Wakandans are, Wakandans, certain Wakandans are not going to like it. Certain Wakandans <laughs> are not li- going to like mm-hmm. it. Yeah. The bleeding of resources, using resources on others, people that is going to be a sacrifice that not everybody is going to take. The like, Great Mound could dry up. Oh, yeah. my God. But, I mean, you know, if you... Uh, th- there is that, but also, like, what's the alternative? Sure. Too, you know? Yeah, of so. course, the alternative is worse. But like, the fact that it co- the fact that it comes down to one man's decision is a tremendous amount to bear. Yeah. The fact that this movie is addressing all of this is amazing. Yeah. That, and that's what makes you know Black Panther so darn exciting. Yeah. So we get to we get to the the, the third act. Um, T'Challa has has lost the fight, and he visits his father once again on the ancestral plane. Um, that sequence, that's the one where he confronts him about, you know, your traditions, you all were wrong to close your borders. and You were wrong to, to turn on this child. Well, he's not only yeah. addressing T'Chak in that moment, he has all the past leaders, right. you know, right. in, in that ancestral plane. He's, he's addressing T'Chak, he's addressing everybody, because the villain in this movie is them. Yeah. They allowed this to happen. Yeah. And so he mm-hmm. comes back, and um, he's given the heart-shaped flower, and uh, we have their final confrontation between, well, I was going to say between he and Killmonger, but before that happens, Killmonger squares up with the Dora Milaje. Uh, we have Baku and his tribe. It's Kamen Civil Jabari. War now. Yeah. yeah. So what, what were your thoughts about that particular sequence? To, to me, I was telling Brad about this. Like, there's a lot about that sequence that feels like I am watching Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Except for everybody is black. <laughs> it it yeah. it felt it felt like a lot like that scene on um, in uh, Wonder Woman. Except oh. for everybody is black. Yeah, which is something that we've never seen before. Yeah. Yeah. There is because it takes place in Wakanda, this kind of fantastical place, and there's like like the technology is now one with magic, yeah. and you know it it has that fantasy elements to it yeah and then you've got freaking war rhinos rampaging through you know the rubble i was just thinking about yeah. that the image of uh t'challa taking down a rhinoceros that that was that's just that's pretty cool yeah, yeah pretty you know nice. like i have seen some complaints about the cg work uh, in, in the film but my response is does you know okay does it look like cg yeah well that's because it's cg and also we're watching goddamn big rhinoceros war rhinoceroses yeah. you know yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we get Shuri uh, who uh, wielding her gauntlets, uh, her panther gauntlet. Yeah. Shuri comes out. A little, a little sonic boom. Yeah. The, gauntlets. the introduction of Nakia and Shuri armed. There's that one shot where the the her, where Nakia's discs, her come Tron up. discs, come up, yeah. and then Shuri's panther come. cannons come up. Yeah. Before the door opens. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, dude, like right now, I have goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Just that shot is yeah. so exciting. The door opens. And then they come out, blast, blast. Yeah. You know, oh, oh, so yeah. good. And Nikki was awesome. I, well, I just, uh, we got to talk about the, as I was going to say, Nikki was awesome in that scene with her, her blade discs. Mm-hmm. But, I, I mean, I just want to talk about the, just the depiction of strong women in the film. And 
in a Marvel film, it's big news now that Scarlett Johansson is finally <laughs> getting uh, a Black Widow film. Mm-hmm. Obviously, in light of the success Where's of the Wonder green Woman, light? I don't see no green light. Right, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, writing off the success of Wonder Woman, Lisa, a film that you mentioned had images that we had never seen before. But I, but I think that you know, it is the, a, a large part of the conversation should be, and it's hugely important, uh, revolving around just the strong depiction. Of women in the film, like there wasn't a scene where a man had to rescue any one of the females in this movie. The 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 lead of the film, his royal guard, his bodyguards, whom he trusts his life with, are all female. Um, I just think I took Sia to see it yesterday, Mm -hmm. and Sia is four or five different people in the movie. I'm that person. Okay, I'm serious. (laughs) Okay, what's the girl with the panther? Okay, I'm her. Wait, what's the one with the rounds? The round swords. The, the blade, the circle blades, yeah, yeah, I'm her. So just for her to be able to pick and choose like that, just from one film. I yeah. mean, honestly, it's the same thing with, you know, seeing all these black faces, seeing all these female figures, uh, and also being, you know, not just being like the badass uh, action heroine, you know, th- there there are, are all the shades of, of character mm-hmm. and all the, in all these different faces. It... It just shows how deprived we've been. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, it really does stand out yeah. on both, uh, you know, uh, a, a race and gender uh, point. Yeah, Th- that's true. This is still a tremendously masculine story, though. You know, Black Panther. He is dealing with um, the death of his father and the influence of his father. Killmonger is dealing with mm. the death of his father and the influence sure. of his father. Mkabe is dealing with. The death, the death of his father. <laughs> so it's still like a tremendously masculine story. Mm-hmm. But the fact that, you know, this is a like, you know, we have not had a, a black superhero movie ever uh, to, to this scale, an African superhero movie to the scale. I go, okay, now, now we can have a really good female, female driven superhero story. Like, and I don't want to take away from, the, the amazingness that is the Dora Milaje and the, all of these really diverse and, and wonderful female characters that are depicted in this film, but they're still secondary characters. And, you know, this is still a male-dominated society. Like, um, only one of the challengers of, like, potential challengers of T'Challa was a woman. Only one. And, um... And none, no women challenged him. It, and, and as far as we can tell, you know, the king, like, you know, like when the king died, like Ramonda did not become king. You know what I mean? And would that be, di- like, could a woman become king? I have no idea. Shuri has become queen in the comics. In the comics, yeah, right. Yeah, and, and she has also become a, a Black Panther. Right. So, so that would be fucking cool. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. would be very cool. But th- this is still a very male-dominated story, even with these secondary female characters. Yeah. Well, I will say the the the, the thing about um, the each male character dealing with the absence of a father, right? right. Uh, it's it, at least within Black culture, within Black, especially American Black American culture, uh, that's something that for black males that will be readily identifiable. Right. Uh, and I'm not saying that that excuses it for Oh, no, and I'm not... And I, thing, but if but you I'm look just, at the other characters of the the Marvel universe, most of them, most of the male characters over half are dealing with father issues. Tony Stark. Sure. Star-Lord. You know, like, I was trying to go through and think, okay, uh, Captain America doesn't really have father issues. Well, I mean, his dad died. His dad and, did and his die, but died. his mom too. So, yeah. like, it's like even. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and and, um, and that is a really common theme for male characters to to be and male superhero characters. and male superhero it, it characters. But it's the same like them. with like Disney princesses. <laughs> Disney princesses generally have mother issues. So I, I, I think that it just points to this is still a traditionally male genre, you know, and um and and we do, we are seeing it open it up. And and I am curious to see, okay, what what is a what is the Black Widow movie going to be? How is the wasp going to be depicted? And and you know, and and this movie, you know, makes me hopeful. I mean I'm excited. Yeah. But um but it's still not, you know, like, 
Wakanda, like the way it's depicted in this film, is not an equal, is not, does not have a level of equality that I can see um, gender equality terms. Oh, you mean uh, how the, the traditions are and yeah. stuff? Or, yeah. 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 Not, not yet. Yeah. And when, I don't know if a lot of that has to do with, because they're based on real traditions where maybe males were, you know, or, or maybe in the because or the, the script is written by males, Ryan, Ryan Coogler and, 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 and well, super, the superhero genre is a male dominated genre. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think that that, that is also part of it. Yeah. So, and, and I'm not saying that, that there aren't male stories that should still be told. Male stories should always be told because, you know, half of the I feel earth like is we're male. getting off on a tangent Yes, here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but like even in a black, if a Black Widow movie happens or when a Captain Marvel movie happens or a Shuri movie or an Akoya movie, it is going to be a badass, ass-kicking kind of film. It, yeah. It's, it's the, the genre, it, it necessitates And action. it lo- owes its legacy in part to Black Panther and, and, and what Black Panther has done as a film. Yeah. So with the final confrontation between uh, T'Challa and Eric, um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I, 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 I love that. I love, I love Killmonger because he takes the suit that uh, T'Challa initially said was too ostentatious. He's, yeah. You know, we, King should be a little more subtle. Yeah. Uh, but Killmonger takes that giant necklace with the, the teeth. To yeah. his credit, it was the only one left. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. You could have taken the old one, put all the old gold helmet. <laughs> I would have taken the old one. Yeah. Uh, a- anyway, so then, then you have, you know, a cat fight, you know, Panther versus Panther. Yeah. And I, I love all that stuff. I, you know, I'm a sucker for it. And they go down into the vibranium mine and the trains are spinning around. But it's also cutting back to what's happening with the Dora Milaje versus Wakabe's army. And then, of course, um, Mbaku, and Jabari, yeah, tribe. the Jabari tribe shows up, mm-hmm. and I love that moment. That moment when um, Okoya and Nakia uh, and Shuri are in, uh, captured yeah. um, within the shields of Wakabe's army, and Wakabe's like, "You've got three seconds," and then you hear the war cry of the Jabari, yeah. and then you know Mbaku lifts that one dude up. Tosses him, yeah. and then this female uh, Jubari jumps into frame, mm-hmm. screaming, and impales a dude with a spear. Yeah. That image, oh, yeah, the best. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. Yeah, it's great. I, Brian, you know, yeah. So, sorry, Brian, your thoughts on the final confrontation? Oh, between uh, uh, T'Challa and Killmonger, I thought it was great. Um, I loved all the stuff, like you say, down in the mine, and even uh, when the uh, the tra- the sonic. Uh, uh, stabilizers boom. yeah stabilizers from the train would go and you would see their suits kind of get you know de-armored or whatnot and just even them talking and whatnot and even when you hear Killmonger say you know he's like he says something to the effect of like you know everything that I love was taken away from me now you could feel the hurt and the pain and the anger uh that still resides in him and uh I, don't know, I just thought that that fight between the two of them uh was really I don't know it was just really impactful and especially even after afterwards, yeah. when he when he kills him, and uh, like I don't know, everything Michael B. Jordan was doing in this movie was just so, just so profound as far as like his performance. Um, like when him after he gets stabbed in the chest and he's talking to T'Challa and he's telling him like, you know, like my father said, you know, he was going to bring me to Wakanda. And it's like, you know, what is it for a kid from Oakland believing in fairy tales and. Even when he goes to the uh, to the ancestral plane and he talks to Injabu and and tells him like uh, you know the, the the sunsets in Wakanda are some of the most beautiful sunsets you'll ever see and T'Challa takes Killmonger out there to see the to see that beautiful sunset and uh, he he tries to give him one last chance he's like you know we can fix you and I didn't know where that where that interaction was going to go because I, I've heard before that a lot of people compare the relationship between Killmonger and T'Challa as like this Professor X uh, Magneto type of relationship. So I thought this would be something that okay maybe he'll he'll live or they'll they'll continue this relationship this this back and forth with ideals and ideology. But um, when he says you know we can fix you and he's like no he's like what well, just to put me in prison. He's like, no, nah. he's like, I would, you know, uh, you can you can bury me in the ocean with my ancestors jump from the ships because they knew that they knew that death was better than bondage. And I was like, 
even after I saw that the first time, like that line has fucking stayed with me to this day. I'm like, wow, it's, he's just such an incredible character that they that they built. Uh, what what Coogler and Jordan did with that character of Killmonger was just absolutely fantastic. And again, at that moment, to feel sympathy for a villain. I don't think I've ever felt that for a villain before, at least at least not that I can think of uh, right now in the moment. But man, that that really just brought a tear to my eye, like in those final moments with Killmonger. I, mean, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, this film could have been called Killmonger, right? It, 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 it's 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 not a villain story. It's the story of. Yeah. Uh, a broken human being, a poisoned human yeah. being, because of yeah. history and, and 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 circumstance. And you, I do cry. Um, I have cried uh, all three yeah. all three showings of Black Panther at Killmonger's death. And it comes down to what is T'Challa going to do? Right. How is he going mm-hmm. to respond to this? human beings actions i think that he learned a tremendous amount from killmonger you know he learned so much from eric and and um and nakia and um and just from looking and Akoya at and wakabi oh, yeah all yeah, of them yeah and and, and Mbaku. yeah and that's going to inform the the king that he's meant to be he, he's not going to be a reiteration of t'chaka and t'chaka's ideals it just can't happen anymore yeah all right yeah. um so what do you what are your thought about, thoughts about the, the the final sequence, Brian? I know you had mentioned it earlier um, about the, the the closing scene where they are back. Oh yeah, um, Brad and Lisa. What what are your thoughts about that 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 closing sequence? Oh, I just thought it was beautiful. I thought it was really wonderful. I I think that uh, Shuri has had a tremendous arc throughout the story. Um, she is the most Western influenced of all of the characters because of her access to technology um you know she has visions of what is california like and she and knows about coachella she yeah she knows about coachella <laughs> and, but also um she's learned a lot about what wakanda means to her and what ritual means to her like you know at the beginning of the film she disrupts the ritual by making a joke you know like oh we're doing this you know, huge thing. Everybody knows is going to be king, so why are we getting all dressed up? This seems silly. Yeah. And then throughout the course of the film, she sees the sacrifices people are making for Wakanda. She sees her brother saved by this ritual, the ritual of the heart-shaped herb, pulling him out of the coma where she would have brought him to the lab. You know, he, he's healed by, by this ritual. And, and so now I think she has a deeper understanding of... of what this marriage of technology and ritual is and um and costs and costs and you know the fact that she she as a youth you know i was surprised that her character is supposed to be like a teenager i i was reading mm-hmm. her as like a tw- like a 20 year old 20s but but um the actress is like in her mid 20s yeah the actress is in her mid 20s but still like the fact that she is she is the youth of Wakanda and the fact that she's going to be interacting directly with um, the youth of the United States and she gets to be and and she gets to interact with with kids who have not seen who who have not seen the impossible happen yeah. who who have not had the opportunity to create their own reality and and, and to create their own future I think that that's going to be a really meaningful relationship. Yeah. To me, it's impossible to watch the opening and closing scene and not think of young Ryan Coogler right. in yeah. Oakland. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. And you know, there's that line that Brian was just talking about that Killmonger says. You know, can you imagine this this little kid from Oakland believing in fairy tales? Mm-hmm. And that's Ryan Coogler, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And you know, that's him. Uh, getting excited about Spider-Man comics and Captain America comics, Captain America comics, and then asking the clerk at the store, "Well, is there a hero that looks like me?" And being handed that Black Panther comic, yeah. you know, when you listen to Kugler talk about his youth and really, you know, who is he making Black Panther for? He's making Black Panther for 
the the child that was him, you know, yeah. that, you know that the, he's contributing something that he never received. Yeah. And one thing I think is funny, mm. and I don't know if this was like an ad lib or what, but like one of the kids is like. They see this ship. It looks like an alien ship. They're not afraid. They just walk right the fuck up to it. And one of the kids is like, we could break this down into pieces and sell it. I'm like, that is yeah. a fucking rough neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> Do not park over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. And, and, but then, I mean, you, when you're talking about that scene, you have to talk about the kid who spots T'Challa and recognizes yeah. that dude over there, that's his ship. Yeah. What's his deal? Let's go talk to that guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and then that, you know, that silent, that knowing smile that T'Challa gives that child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like the I like the idea of like with him saying that, well, oh, yeah, I bought that building. I bought this building, this building here where our, uh, our father murdered our uncle. Mm-hmm. Um, instead of having it demolished and wiping away all traces of this this past uh, trauma and this history, I'm going to build on it and but build something that's going to positively affect uh the future and so i like the idea of that again with what we deal with in our country as far as like race relations and how this country has a problem denying uh i'm sorry has a problem admitting that there is such a problem when you know a, a, a teenager can go into a school and shoot up a bunch of kids and then the headline reads has a troubled past, had a, you know, did no parents or whatever. But if someone of color or of Muslim descent or whatever shoots up something or something happens, the first thing you see is a terrorist. You know, they won't, but they won't address why that's the case. They won't address why everything is geared, is, is presented the way it is. And that's the problem with the country. They don't want to address that we have a, a, a country that's currently now one of the superpowers of the world is the Wakanda of the world, but it's built so on the blood of, of immigrants and slaves and things like that. It, won't, it, it wants to burn the building down and say it never existed and build up on top of that, build something else. Whereas we could be a better people if we acknowledge what happened in this building and not run away from it. Um, but use what happened here as a foundation to build and make sure it never happens again. And that's what, to me, that's what the closing remarks of that film signify. And, you know, and as that film being a mirror to our society, you know, it just, you know, the imagination runs wild with, you know, damn, like, I, you know, something like this. I don't look at it like, man, what if I could have a flying car like that? I think about, damn, what if I could have a fucking society like that mm-hmm. that would build off of, you know, your, your history, and even if it's bad? So, no, that's what I, my takeaway from the final moments of that film. Um, man, the, so we have two post-credit scenes. Mm-hmm. We have a mid-credit sequence and a stinger. Let's talk about that one. So the, the first the credit f- sequence. The first credit sequence basically underlines everything that they've been building towards and, and sort of reiterates what T'Challa says to Shuri in Oakland. Right. Um, it's T'Challa returning to the place of his father's death, yeah. the United Nations office building in, in uh, Vienna, Austria, to address the world that Wakanda isn't hiding anymore. He's, he's basically continuing the conversation that T'Chaka had back in Civil War. Mm-hmm. Wakanda is ready to meet the world. We're going to, we're going to get together. We're going to help you out. We have the resources that can, that can aid the rest of this planet. And he does the Bruce Lee thing, right? You know, we're all one tribe under the sky. Yeah. I, yeah. Like, uh, I, I, I love that, I love yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then there's that, you know, asshole. I don't remember what country he came from. I, I don't know. He had a vaguely European yeah. mixed yeah. accent. Mr. Nazi head, I'll call him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he says, like, what, does Wakanda, what can Wakanda possibly offer? What resources could they possibly offer us? And then again, just like he had that knowing smile in Oakland, he's got that knowing smile yeah. in, in, in... And we also get a little shot of Ross yeah. looking like, yeah. hee hee. <laughs> <laughs> I was there first. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, then the second one um, continues where we left off from Civil War mm-hmm. uh, with Bucky waking up in Wakanda uh, with Shuri. Uh, let's talk about that. I also think that this is interesting, like development of Shuri's character. Like, the fact that she has um, has Bucky out in nature, you know, in this hut, like, amongst the people, not the and not in the lab, I think, is yeah. 
yeah. is very interesting. Yeah. She does have a jacket with zippers, though. That is true. <laughs> she's still she's still very influenced. <laughs> I love her look. Her love her look is just like a little cute little dress with something clear over it. <laughs> That's gonna be, when you see me dressed out in my in my Shuri cosplay. It's gonna be a fucking clear raincoat <laughs> over a fitted well, dress. Okay. <laughs> you know, we did get um, some questions. Uh, from our listeners. Yep. And I only bring this up now rather than waiting to the end because uh, at Jason underscore Plo did ask, you know, that he needs your thoughts on the post-credit Bucky White Wolf scene. Don't entirely get the importance of that. Um, so, I mean, obviously it's, you know, Bucky has been recuperated and probably cured of the programming that mm -hmm. uh, infected his white uh, winter soldier persona. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one element of this end credit sequence that I have not seen addressed uh, much online, if at all, is the White Wolf uh, naming. And in the comics, White Wolf is a character who looks similar to Black Panther, but has, you know, a, a white costume. Uh, and that, that character is the character of Hunter. It's a convoluted thing where, to, you know, T'Chaka adopted this white child who crash-landed in Wakanda and raised him as a stepbrother to uh, T'Challa. And, you know, as they grew up, uh, Hunter kind of had this Loki envy uh, where he felt like T'Challa preferred or T'Chaka preferred T'Challa over him. And as T'Challa went out and joined the Avengers and you know met the rest of the world, he felt like it was betraying the culture of Wakanda. So he sets out against the Black Panther and, he, and donning the, the White Wolf mantle. I don't think any of that storyline is going to happen in the MCU, but I do think it's kind of interesting to tie Bucky to Wakanda to give him a relationship uh, to this country outside of the events of what we've seen in the Captain America films. And in my mind, I immediately start writing story, you know, where, you know, at some point, probably in Avengers 4, not Infinity War, Captain America is going to get killed off. Sam, the Falcon, is going to take on the mantle of um, Captain, America. Captain America. And he's, and, and, and Bucky is going to find emotional solace in the place where he was reborn and, 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 and healed in Wakanda. And he's going to come back to Wakanda and we'll have, you know, he'll take on a white wolf type mantle. Yeah. I think that's what's going to happen as well. <laughs> I agree. Good question. Next question. Uh, so we have from at uh, Kern Setra Yay. on Twitter. He has two questions. Number one, how do you think the success of Black Panther will change minority representation in big budget films going forward? And then number two, does Black Panther deviate enough from the Marvel formula to qualify as true artistic vision? How so? I didn't care for it, but I'm very excited to hear your thoughts. What? He didn't care for Black Panther, the film? Apparently, Kern did not. No. If he made it this way... This, this far, this in far the, into the it, he knows that we loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Let's address the the first question. You know, do, how do you think it'll access? How the, do you think the success of Black Panther will change the minority representation of big budget films going forward? Um, because it is going to be a huge financial success, and because Hollywood is a business at the end of the day. And they see that uh, black audiences will show up to films with black representation, and there's money in that, and so, of course, it's going to change. Um, but, I mean, at the end of the day, it will be, it will mean more black representation. Um, but I think that's, it's a, it's a, it all comes down to money at the end of the day, unfortunately. Yeah. I think the, the bigger figure here is the global figure. Black Panther had a tremendous global uh, impact yeah. this past weekend, and that really, uh, attacks the lie that uh, international crowd will not show up to a film that has a pro predominantly black cast. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Uh, the, the, the future is pretty exciting with regards to that, just to see what that turns into. Now, what are your thoughts? Is Black Panther an artistic experience? 
Oh, is the artistic experience? Yeah, I do think um, Ryan Coogler was able to really bring in his style. I mean, it's really kind of hard to say because with a lot of these big budget studio films, um, a, a lot of the stuff is already kind of, especially when you talk about action sequences and stuff like that, a lot of that stuff is pre-visualized and there's not really much, um, I guess, structurally or like technically that you can really do. But I think Ryan Coogler was really able to kind of, looking at his past films, I think he was really able to kind of inject um, a lot of, per, like you say, personal things into the story that we haven't necessarily seen in other um, specifically Marvel films. Um, and also just speaking to that as well, if you look at his filmography from all three films, he really does focus on fatherhood. I mean, if you look at Fruitvale Station, it focuses on Oscar Grant III and the relationship with his daughter. Um, and then you look at Creed, that's all about uh, Adonis and, you know, the absence of his father and trying to come up with his own, like trying to find his own identity out of the shadows of his father. And then everything that we've talked about in Black Panther, um, dealing with the father-son aspects in this movie. And just knowing Ryan Coogler and listening to, not, well, not knowing him personally, but uh, listening to him in interviews, the relationship that he has with his own father, you know that this is something that is really personal and really important to him is that, uh, is that father-child relationship. And um, I like that he's able to kind of put that into uh, all of his films. So I think in that respect, you're definitely able uh, to see his touch uh, in, in this film. And, you know, we talked about it coming out of the screen. You definitely see some of his stylistic flourishes popping up over the course of this movie, too. The way he uses mm -hmm. sound or uh, removes sound. Yeah, uh, is yeah very absolutely. Cool. I also don't think Yeah, and a, lot, a lot of the one takes. I don't think that so, something that's made by a group group effort is a, necessarily a lower art. Yeah, no, of course not. I mean, you know, the the reality is is all film is commercial, <laughs> uh, but you can sure, have commercial sure. and art uh, coexist. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we got another question here from our pal at Chris underscore Chaka. Uh, he asks, "How do you think the action rates? I love the Russo's brothers' execution, but the fights are so much cleaner and steadier in Black Panther." Uh, oh, Brian, you want to take it? I'm thinking. Um, I, to be honest with you, I actually, as far as the action, I actually like the Russo's action a little bit better um, than what I saw in the Black. Not saying that Black Panther and the way it was shot and the choreography and you know the shot composition, how everything was. I thought it was really, really good. But some of the stuff that the Russos, uh, the Russos do, especially in Winter Soldier. Yeah. Is just absolutely phenomenal, and I guess just speaking on that aspect, I still think the Russos um, have the action part of it down. So I will echo what you just said, Brian. My favorite action in the Marvel universe is, occurs in this in Winter Soldier. Yeah, uh, and there are moments in Black Panther I feel like aren't as strong as they could have been from an action standpoint. Uh, in particular, the yeah. slave trader uh, sequence, the first uh, Black Panther reveal, is decent, but it's a little choppy. Not my style of yeah. action that I prefer. But going to that South Korea sequence, yeah, I love everything that's happening there. And that's some of my favorite action mm -hmm. uh, period, uh, not just in the MCU, but outside. Like just seeing the... The panther suit realized for the first time that new iteration, seeing uh, Okoya uh, devastate those people with her spear, and then seeing mm -hmm. you know Shuri uh, behind the wheel. I think all of that is handled really, really, really well. And yeah. you know, I think the final Killmonger battle is decent, and I like the uh, Lord of the Rings um, <laughs> uh, style of fighting that you see yeah. among yeah. the tribes. Yeah. All right. What else we got? Uh, Chris Chalk is not done. He's got another one. Oh. He says, uh, also, love the scene where Shuri tells Ross it's not magic, it's technology, like he's a rube who just woke up 100 years in the future. <laughs> I pray she gets to say something patronizing to Tony Stark in Infinity War where he's <laughs> gobsmacked by her skills. Yes. Oh, my God, I didn't uh, even think about I them think meeting. They're going to meet. Oh, my Yeah, I think that's, that's coming. Especially the fact that they've said that Shuri is the smartest person in the MCU. Um, at some point, whether it's Infinity War or Avengers 4, 
there's going to be an interaction between Tony Stark and Shuri, and I, I'm I'm so looking forward to it. <laughs> and then finally, I'm hopping on over to our Facebook page. Uh, we have. Uh, Shara Valentine, she says, uh, I need a lot of discussion about the amazing women in this film. The fact that the King's Guard were all female made me infinitely happy, and the fight scenes in the club where they're using their shoes and wigs as weapons was so well done. Also, I think this is the second time that Marvel has gotten me to cry over the death of a villain. I really wanted to save him. And of course, that post credit scene, I want to see more Bucky in Wakanda. Uh, I did ask her what was the first villain to die that she cried over, and it was Loki's death in the Dark World. Mm. Yay. Aww. Not yay for Loki dying, but yay for Dark World. You be he was only you. mostly dead. <laughs> yeah. You be you, Darren. That's all I got to say. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think we've addressed a lot of that, Char, I, I hope. Uh, in our, our past uh, conversation, we just echo everything that you said. We agree. Uh, I like the the um, idea of an action cocktail dress, a driving skirt. <laughs> All of that is wonderful. I need. I need to check. I need. I, how is it not easy to drive in a skirt? Like why? Well, you, okay. So imagine the mechanics, Lisa. Imagine if this the skirt is narrow. Okay. Oh, like, now, like you need a certain amount of. For one thing. You know, you need a certain amount of like spread to reach to the um, pedal and brake. to the pedal mm. and to the brake, and then you want to keep your other leg out of the way. You know, generally when you drive. Yeah. So, so that like if so to have that, and uh, of course you're wearing either a flat shoe, uh -huh. like if you're wearing a dress, you're either wearing a flat shoe, which is a thin shoe to drive with, or a heel, which is terrifying to drive with. <laughs> So, so that's that's horrible. Now, if you're wearing a short skirt, then shit just gets breezy. Oh, okay. So it's it's just a matter of just knee needing your knees apart. It's gotcha. very indecent. And then when you're sitting with your knees apart, then getting out of a car is very hard. Oh, because you're gonna flash your business. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's gonna inform my drive home <laughs> this evening. I'm gonna be looking down in my lap. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think I could do that. You can, but it just it's just not, not the best. Gotcha. All right. Everything is made harder. Uh, as of right now, I'm still deciding if I'm going to take out or leave that conversation in. Uh, I say keep it. Yeah. Uh, I want to know from my fellow dorks, where does Black Pan Panther currently rank in oh, your no. MCU? Mm. I'm not a ranker. Oh, right? I'm not. I'm not. I can't answer that right now. You can't answer that no. right now. I haven't even rated it on Letterboxd yet. Well, you know. Yeah. Brian, I know you've already rearranged your ranking, right? You had to. Well, I've started because of the real because I've never ranked the Marvel movies, so I'm kind of ranking them as I'm doing this rewatch. But so, uh, like never, you've never when we asked nah. that question on the show. Hmm. All right, so nah, Brian, not, Brian, I, I'm never. What, what, where does Black Panther rank out of all the Marvel movies you've recently watched? Oh, it's at the top. Okay. As far as what I watch, because I'm at what Thor: The Dark World. I'm gonna end up watching that. I don't think it's gonna top. I don't think <laughs> Thor: The it's Dark World is gonna to. top Black Panther. Sorry, Darren, but um, <laughs> but no, out of out of everything that I've watched now so far, it's definitely um, at the top. D Darren, do you have but any I idea of where it could land? Because uh, even before Black Panther ever came in, like. My the my Marvel MCU ranking is one that every once in a while I look at it and go, did I did I do that right? Is that right? I'm not <laughs> sure if I want that one. So I don't know. Like your I, rankings do love to fluctuate. Right um, now, what's your favorite uh, Marvel movie? Uh, shit, I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. I, I forgot what my most recent <laughs> ranking was. Like I don't know. Like and and also going through with this rewatch, like. Again, like movies that I, I that I thought were I was just okay with, like I found out I really liked, and ones that I thought that I really liked, I'm just like okay with. So I don't know, cause I don't know. I I, I still ha I'm still processing. I'm still processing Black Black, Black Panther as far as like so on its own. You, can you say that you loved it or you liked it? What Black Panther? Yeah. Oh, I like Black Panther a lot. But did you love it? Uh, I don't know. I I, I that's oh I gotta goodness. I gotta, gotta live the most with infuriating. It. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. I'll, I'll stop pressuring you, Lisa. I loved it. I loved Black Panther. I thought it was a really beautiful movie. I I 
So I've watched it technically. I've been in the theater three times. But that 1030 rewatch, you know how I get. You know, Darren, I get sleepy beepy. Sleepy beepy. And so I, I really, like, my second viewing was really just an extended trailer <laughs> as I drifted in and out of consciousness. Um, but the second time watching that film, I was even, I mean, I cried more. I was yeah. pr- profoundly moved. A- and and even just, you know, every time we sit down to discuss a film, I find out that I love it more just Ooh, in, in, yeah, the di- in the pondering of it, in the discussion of it. Yeah. Um, I, I still really love the Guardians of the Galaxy. And... Um, I, and uh, the, the the music aspect, the comedy aspect. I mean, there is comedy in Black Panther. It's not. I mean, and because of the the source, the, the you know, the subject. The subject is a it's a it's a um, sadder film. Yeah. Uh, it's a tough. You know, so like you know, it can't be like funny hahas. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But I I still think that um, maybe Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two. It's your favorite? It might, might be my favorite. Okay. I'm just putting it out Over there. Over the first one? Over the first one? Over the first one, okay. yeah. Like you, Lisa, yeah. You like Darren, you do you. That's I cool. know, I Dang. know. I can only. <laughs> I love Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I agree with Lisa. Yeah. It's it's superior to the original film. Uh, and Black Panther currently sits at number four on my top 18 uh, black, or uh, top 18 I mean, Black Marvel Panther movies. films yeah. in the Black Panther universe. <laughs> they are now yeah. all... But that's the thing, like, I mean, just the way uh, Guardians of the Galaxy opened up the possibilities, so does Black Panther. You can have so many different stories uh, branching out of Wakanda. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. It's exciting times. I'm looking forward to it. And I can't wait to see the Avengers come to Wakanda in Infinity War. I hope they don't completely break it. Oh, they, they trash, might, but they trash Thanos. everywhere they go. <laughs> so yeah, Fucking don't touch anything. My brother's gonna be right back. Oh man, but I am looking forward to <laughs> Sherry meeting Tony Stark. That is, a I didn't even think about that. Exciting. It's gonna be idea. Tony Stark, Sherry, oh. and Bruce Banner in the lab trying to figure shit out. Mm-hmm. That's pretty. Scientists. That's pretty awesome. And Doctor Strange. That's pretty awesome. Or just Banner and uh, Stark just being in awe of her. Yeah. Like, what the what? what? That is awesome. You know what I want to see? I want to see the Iron Man enhanced, Wakanda enhanced suit. Do you know yeah. what I want to see? I want to see um, Captain America and Bucky Barnes kiss. I know. That's going to happen. Like, Steve's dying. Yeah. Bucky's definitely going to kiss him. <laughs> right on the, I want it square on the lips, please. Okay. Uh, Guardians 1 is my number one, by the way. Okay, there we go. All right. Nice. Age of Ultron, my number two. Ooh. I mean, I, I love Age, Age of, of Ultron. Ultron is great. Spider-Man number three. Yes. Avengers number four. Yes. That's before I fi- factor in Black Panther, so I don't know. I, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> but like, is there a potential? Like, we are dragging this episode out so long. Is there a potential for Black Panther to be in the top five? Uh, Give me a potential. Darren. Yeah, it's a potential. There's definitely potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about you, Brian? Do you think Black What's Panther's that? in your top five Marvel movies? Oh, easily. Okay, okay. For me, yeah, my opinion, yeah, for me, yeah. Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. We can all remain friends. All right. I <laughs> use it to bump Civil War out of top five. Oh! Just kidding. That's number nine anyway. <laughs> oh! I know you're anti Civil War. I'm not. I'm not. I liked it better than Winter Soldier. God damn. Sorry, that's wrong. Winter Soldier is my favorite. Yeah. Winter Your words my are favorite. barbs. That's right. That's right. Listeners, hit us up on social media. Uh, let us know your thoughts on Black Panther. Let us know your your ranking of the film in the MCU. Uh, and anything else you want to discuss? We are at It Modcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterbox. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bra- Brian Young is at the Turtle Dork on Twitter, Instagram. <sighs> he is the Turtle Dork One, and on Facebook, he's at Brian William Young. Uh, wife Dork is at Sidewalk Siren on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Facebox, <laughs> Facebox. <laughs> that, that's Don't, a thing, right? Yeah, that's like the second time. That's I've the second it. time you've done that. <laughs> Facebox. Maybe it's a thing because I'm only saying. Yeah, anyway, you want to get in that Facebox? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, <laughs> Brad is Brad, at Mouth Dork on at, all social medias. At Mouth Dork. That's right. And I'm Darren Smith, the Disco Dork on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Letterbox and untap and face box. Uh, thank you all for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week. Go out and watch the movie again. And until next time. <laughs>
African ancestry, Northeastern geographically. I'm talking about a tip that invaders defended, masterful vibranium. Crashed on our land and changed it drastically, making us advanced in the world technologically. Uh, one of the eight smartest men on the planet is from a tribal clan in Africa. I know you can't stand it. How can a genius and a scholar that has studied abroad still be primal and worship a panther god? Best bestowed upon me abilities from the heart shaped earth. I'm combat ready. Don't come at me like I'm a nerd. They conflict with Black Panther. You don't want those props. Ask Captain America. He got beat by my father from a place where nowhere in the world has jurisdiction. Not even shield can visit here without our permission. This country is Wakanda, one like you've never seen. In this country, I'm T'Challa, the chieftain of things. I am king.